That one actually wasn't as slow for everyone to go quiet as I thought it might be, so I'm almost getting to primary school headmistress level of uh, standing there quietly while everyone starts uh, going quiet. But thank you very much for joining us this morning for uh, Mason Hayes and Kern's fifth annual energy conference. Um, conference is titled uh, um, Energy Security in a Net Zero World. And we actually surprisingly started talking about this topic as the theme for the conference uh, in January or February of this year when we were book booking the venue. And little did we know that as we were um, going into uh, September and uh, the winter of what really may be an, an actual Cold War, uh, that this would be such a hot topic. Um, so I'm delighted everyone's been able to, to make it this morning. Um, we hope we've put together um, three panels which are going to be covering really topical and interesting things. We're not going to fix the energy crisis in the next few months. Uh, we're not going to fix the energy crisis in the next couple of years. But the... The, the panels will be talking about issues that are really important that, as an economy, um, the, you know, Ireland needs to start focusing on these points or else we're never going to deliver the transition that, that we require. So um, I'm not going to hold you up any further. We're already running a little bit behind time. And we have a uh, master of ceremonies, uh, Philip Boucher Hayes here, who's far better at emceeing these events than I ever will be. So I will hand you over to Philip uh, to, to run the show. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Hello, good morning. How are you? My name is Philip Boucher Hayes. Um, I've been reporting in the area of climate change for close to 20 years or so now, or as my children say, boring at an Olympic level in the area of climate change for all of our lives. It's my very, very great pleasure to be here this morning for what, as Owen says, could not be a more appropriately timed conference on a more relevant theme. Because I think climate change and the energy crisis have passed through two key thresholds uh, in my mind. The first is the, the taxi driver test. There is not a taxi driver to be found anywhere in this city who doesn't now have an opinion on data centres and what should happen to them and what should be done. And some of those opinions are even actually close to the mark and correct for a change. Uh, and the second is the awareness of climate change in people's minds. Five years ago, when Mason Hayes Curran started doing these events, people were still thinking of climate change as a shelf that we were going to fall off, a cliff edge, a precipice that we were going to fall off at some point in the future. I think now there's a much more keen awareness, there's a, a passing through, as I say, a threshold of the consciousness in the public's minds about what the climate crisis actually represents. And that metaphorically, we are at the moment not propelling ourselves towards a cliff edge, but we are falling down a hill. And that hill is getting steeper and steeper, and we are picking up more and more injuries hurting ourselves more, wasting and losing more money the more, the further that we fall. And the most grotesque part of this metaphor is that we are pushing our children in front of us and their children in front of them as well. But we are also aware, I think, that we can change the rate of our falling. We can make that incline less steep. It doesn't have a bottom at the moment, but we can level it out with the actions that we are going to take in this generation. And that's where I'm going to stop the whole doom-laden, portentous introduction thing, because I don't think it's, it's apposite. I don't think that it's particularly accurate for where we are, because in the nearly 20 years that I have been looking at this space, I have never been more optimistic than I am now, which might seem odd given that we are almost certainly, controversial statement here, we are almost certainly going to exceed 1.5 degrees of additional warming above pre-industrial levels uh, in the lifetime of the vast majority of people in this room. I'm giving you 20 years, by the way, if any of you are wondering. Where almost certainly going to come close to, if not exceed, two degrees of additional warming within the lifetime of the children of the people in this room. 
But yet, the difference now is, the difference to 20 years ago, the difference to five years ago, when you had the first of these conferences, is that we have grasped the nettle. We are actually taking action now, and that, I think, is the great cause for optimism. What this conference today is going to address, though, is the friction in that um, and the things that haven't even yet made their way into the national newspapers, onto the national broadcaster, those areas of supply chain, uh, well, let's just say euphemistically hiccups, but the problems that are going to be encountered. Because there is a general assumption uh, publicly that once we said, let's click our fingers on offshore wind energy, that it was just going to happen. And because we have the technology to make these things happen theoretically by 2030, doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to happen by 2030. I was listening to somebody from Jan de Nul, one of the big maritime contractors during the course of the week, talking about these supply chain issues, about things like the shortage of cable laying vessels, foundation laying vessels, the turbine installation rigs. They said, if you want something built by 2030 and you haven't got on the phone to us by the middle of 2023, it is not going to be built because there are some real supply chain pinch points ahead and we have the panels today that are going to address those. That issue is going to be the key issue in the first panel. Uh, our second panel is ESG. Uh, all the things that you don't know <laughs> that you don't know. And hopefully as well, for me, it'll answer, the panel on ESG will answer the question uh, about how it is that we take ESG out of being something that is the preserve of the well-heeled multinational corporations and bring it down to the level of the managing director of a hard-pressed SME who can only think about meeting payroll and doesn't have the bandwidth at the moment to devote to something like ESG. Because unless those companies get to the table on that issue, as the saying goes, they will end up on the menu. They will end up out of business. Because I think that's the other thing that's worth identifying here as the key paradigm shift uh, that has happened in the course of the last five years as well, to my mind, excuse me, to my mind, uh, is that business leaders, the people in this room have, number one, realised that the non-state actors are going to be of key importance to actually provide leadership to government now and get out in front uh, of government in terms of actually implementing climate action, um, but also providing, uh, providing that leadership is what it is that has hopefully the energy that's going to come from this room today. I have a number of pieces of housekeeping which I have to get through. Uh, the first of which, the most important, is can everybody please take their right hand and raise it in the air? All of you. And now place that hand on whatever part of your body it is that you have your phone in. You got worried there for a second, didn't you? You thought there was going to be an act of contrition to be said. And put the phone on to silent, but then go and pick up, once you've done that, the little Toblerone in the middle of your table and scan the QR code. And when you do that, it will automatically bring you to the conference app for the day, which will give you biographical details and the speakers, who they are, contact details, all that sort of stuff. But it will also offer you the opportunity to ask questions via Slido. There will be Q&As after each of these panels. There'll be roving mics, but if you want to make absolutely sure of getting your question in and answered by the panel, submit it by Slido, please which you'll see there is an option in there uh, specifically for polls and questions. You should have gotten to that stage by now if you have successfully downloaded it. Um, and also, uh, to inform the conversation, and have a little bit of fun as well, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to ask directly of you and get you to participate in as we do this. Uh, the final panel today will deal with finance 
uh, and it is going to be the logical extension of the first two panels and it's going to deal with uh, that crucial timing piece now uh, and the RESS auctions uh, and how on earth it is that you put finance in place around something that is so far into the future. But interspersed in between all of these panels, I have the very, very great pleasure of being able to introduce to you two fascinating people. Uh, Catherine Sheridan, who is somebody you are going to be hearing from a lot over the course of the next decade as we make the transition from a carbon to a hydrogen economy, hopefully. And Gabriel Walker, who has a very specific title, but just let me say for the moment that I think of her as a very, very engaging carbon strategist and thinker. The first, though, of our speakers this morning is, as the Minister of State with Responsibility for Procurement, somebody who is going to be keenly aware of the friction in supply chain issues and how they are going to affect the business of climate action. Um, I, I texted him yesterday so that I could look knowledgeable in front of you this morning, and I said, you know, give me a little bit of a scoop on what it is that you're going to be telling this audience, uh, please. Uh, except, unfortunately, I said, give me a line on what you're saying. And he literally gave me a line. He said, why Ireland is placed to become both a climate leader and an energy secure island. Ladies and gentlemen, can I introduce to you Minister of State, Oisín Smith, TD. Thanks, Good. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Philip. When you said you had some fascinating speakers, I was really worried you, were gonna, you meant me. <laughs> I've never been described in that way. Okay, so um, this area of energy, energy security, price, sustainability, that is a niche area that very little people, very few people, I suppose, in Ireland, outside of this room, have paid much attention to. Um, but in 1979, when I was eight years old, uh, it was the talk of the town, it was on everybody's lips. And I remember it, even though I was just eight, I can remember seeing kilometre long queues outside the petrol stations. I remember seeing then people fighting uh, fist to fist on the news at night because I'd got to the front of the queue, they'd run out of petrol, whose turn was it to get the last drop? And I remember when it was brought home to me that one morning I woke up and our family car wouldn't start because the petrol cap had been priced off during the night and somebody had stolen the petrol out of the tank. And some of you will be as old as me and will remember uh, that time where people were, were at that point. And that is a point of crisis. That's the point where my father bought a bicycle for his first time and we all went off together as a family. I remember thinking, this is great, you know? And I remember power cuts as well, around the ca uh, candles around the table. Um, but the truth is that the power cuts were not as bad as the general shortage of fuel and the price. And I think that's, that, that's, that's what's happening at the moment. Although there's a lot of media focus on the potential for, um, for power cuts this winter, I think the chance is very low. However, the probability of having shockingly high energy bills that are challenging affordability and your ability to get to the end of the month is 100%, right? So um, I know the media have to deal with the thing that's today's issue but we're, we're, you know, we're less than 60 days away from people opening their energy bills in November, and that is going to cause trouble. Um, and that is the focus. And what do we learn from the last energy, from, well, I don't know if it's the last energy crisis, from the energy crisis of 79 anyway, um, there was a really uh, rapid rebound afterwards. And uh, everybody going back to the way it was, delighted to be able to resume their, their, their previous behavior, and in fact, a glut of oil in the market. And I remember very cheap, um, oil being available in the 80s. And I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's kind of coming down the road in a year or two years, probably. We do see some softening of oil prices already, uh, which is, you know, some relief. Um, but we, we, we probably are in here for the long haul. I don't think this is going to be uh, just one winter. Um, you know, we, obviously, we, we, we put in sanctions on Russia. And the West of sanctioned Russia thinking... Russia is a small economy, whatever it is, the size of Belgium or whatever, in GDP terms. But really, it has really exposed our dependence on, um, on imported, uh, not just oil, but coal and gas as well. So we, 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 we are now in an economic war. You know, Ireland clearly stated that we are not 
independent, we're not neutral in the, in the war between Russia and Ukraine, but we're more than just not neutral, we're, we're actually clearly involved. And Putin has very clearly said that he believes that his people can take more hardship than ours, and he believes he can win uh, an economic war against us. And I think he's wrong. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, you know, one of, the things, one of the things that we're at an advantage on is that in the EU, we have our solidarity with our fellow uh, countries who, um, who share our values and who are all facing this difficult winter coming towards us. So we're not one island on our own. We're part of a half billion uh, population of people who are facing this in slightly different ways. Obviously, we're an island and there's different energy dependencies in every country, but all of us are under great stress. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see Ursula von der Leyen's comments uh, yesterday. On Friday, there will be an emergency meeting of the EU Council of Energy Ministers, and Eamon Ryan will be there, and there will be decisions made around um, windfall taxes, around common demand reduction across Europe, and around practical ways that we can uh, together um, fight this war. So, um, you know, what's happening in Ireland? What's our, what's our response? What are we doing to, to ensure uh, security of supply? You will know that in April we have our national um, uh, energy security framework was published, which was our general approach. Uh, but part of that was to do an energy security review and to say, you know, what are the, what are the uh, specific measures we need to take? That review has completed and it will go out for public consultation uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, so you, you can look, look forward to that. The Climate Action Plan has been, from, from last year, will be updated also in the coming weeks and that will be far more um, specific. Far, far, there will be far fewer actions than last year, but they will be tighter and they will be more, uh, more measurable. Um, we are still on target for an 80% reduction in fossil fuel use by, uh, by, by 2030. By for, and, you know, we, we, we need that more than ever. We, our, our ambitions for climate action, our ambition to decarbonize our economy, we can see that that is absolutely vital now and that this um, energy crisis is not about uh, the, the price of renewables, it's not about a shortage uh, in the renewable sector, it's about, um, it, it is a fossil fuel crisis and it's, it is, uh, th that's where our problem is. We haven't decarbonized fast enough. There's no point in regretting the past, but we are in a, in a strange position in Ireland where we've done so well on onshore wind and we've made no progress on offshore. We were the first country, we were the leading country to have the first offshore wind farm in Arklow with an Irish company and yet all the other countries passed us out by far. No, hardly any solar in Ireland until that recent first um, solar farm and yet when you travel around Europe and even when you went north of the border you could see solar panels uh, on, on every rooftop. Um, so clearly we, we, we went for one area, we went for onshore wind, we've done great that we've got nearly 40% of our electricity coming from that, that source, but you need diversity. You can't put all your eggs in one basket and we, we, we've done that and we really need now to go forward. And you saw that in the, uh, in the, the debate on um, agriculture and what cuts they could take and how much we should go. The result of that at the end was a decision to increase the ambition for solar uh, and for offshore wind to add an extra two gigs on uh, offshore wind, another two gigawatts for solar and a large quantity of anaerobic digestion. And that will be backed up then with government policies uh, and with actions. And it's easy to come forward and say, make, um, make strategic goals without actually having the, the underpinning actions to go with it. But now we see that we really, we, we, we really need to do this. We really need to move forward. We have been held up by planning delays. And if you look at Repower EU, which is the, the um, EU strategy for what to do about this, um, there's three pillars to it. And one of them is to compress the planning times. And their general approach is they're saying it shouldn't take more than two years to get planning for major infrastructure. And, if we, and in designated areas, every member state has to designate um, go-to areas in which it will only take one year to get your planning permissions. Um, of course, we need a planning system but it is a paradox if the planning system is frustrating our ability to plan. So um, it needs reform, uh, and I know that in the Department of Housing they're working on that, but also we've changed the law. So we have brought in a law that allows us uh, to, to directly grant planning permission in an emergency, and that should have been there, but it's there now. So we can directly consent uh, energy infrastructure 
where there is an immediate need. And we are in a war, so we have an immediate need. Um, okay, so I, I think I should um, say a few things about, uh, in detail about um, offshore wind, because I know many of you are working in that sector. And uh, my, my department has prepared a few things for me to say. So rather than kind of giving you my own opinions and political views on things, I'm going to, I'm going to stick to the script for once. So um, as I said, there is, uh, there is, you know, we had this am ambition to do five gigs of offshore wind by 2030 and another 30 um, in, the, in the coming decade. And we've increased that by another two gigawatts. And that will be linked with the production of green hydrogen and uh, I'm delighted to see Catherine Sheridan here today, who's going to be speaking later about that. Do you know all these changes are really going to spur, as you know, major changes in an economy or in, or in a society are linked with major opportunities for entrepreneurship, and there will be huge economic activity as a result of this transformation, and all of you, I imagine here, many of you are involved in working in that area. Um, we started the process of consenting our first offshore wind projects, and they'll contribute to meeting our targets. The Maritime Area Planning Act of 2021 provides legislation for an entirely new mar mar marine planning system. Um, and you know, that was, for, for us, that was the, the third most important piece of legislation the government brought in. Uh, the first was the Climate Action, uh, the, the Climate Act to, uh, to, to cut our emissions in half in 10 years and to reach net zero by 2050. The second piece of legislation was the Land Development Act, because we need to do something on housing and have a national housing, house building program. And finally, the um, Maritime Area uh, Planning Act. Um, the Department of the Environment, Climate and Communications is designing uh, a pathway for another batch of projects. So this will be the second batch of projects to progress through the new consenting uh, pro system when the Maritime Area Regular Regulatory Authority is established in, the, in early next year. Um, the work on the Offshore Renewable Energy Development Plan is now underway. The plan will provide an evidence base for the identification of the most suitable areas for sustainable offshore renewable energy development, and it will set a pathway for the development of offshore renewables beyond 2030. Um, a cross-departmental offshore wind delivery task force has been established to accelerate and drive delivery, and also to capture wider and longer-term economic and business opportunities associated with the development of offshore renewables in Ireland. This includes identifying supporting infrastructure and supply chain opportunities as the industry is developed. Offshore renewable energy is, of course, vital to Ireland's green energy transition, and it reduces our dependency on imported fossil fuels, it lowers our greenhouse gas emissions, and it strengthens our security of supply. The cost of offshore wind has been falling globally over the past number of years, and it's driven by technological advances and by competitive auction pressures, and accordingly there is increased interest in offshore wind projects uh, off the Irish coast. The department is drafting the terms and conditions for the offshore wind specific auctions under the Renewable Electricity Support Scheme. Owing to the specific scale and nature of typical offshore wind farms, dedicated auctions are initially required to support the longer term potential of this technology in Ireland. As well as further auctions for onshore wind and solar, at least three offshore auctions are currently planned for this decade. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the questions, I suppose, that, that's in the, in the media at the moment or in the public mind is the question of a windfall tax. That's one of the things that uh, Ursula von der Leyen will be discussing on uh, Friday with member states. A number of member states have already introduced the, this kind of tax. And, you know, the question is, should this be limited to fossil fuel suppliers? Uh, should it be limited to those who are involved in extraction rather than generation? Or should it extend to those who've made windfall profits in the renewable sector? And there definitely is an argument for extending into the renewable sector where, those, uh, where there have been uh, excessive profits made and where, where the, the, the nature of their contracts is that there's no upper bound on what they can charge. So you know that when the most recent renewable energy auctions um, we're setting, a, we're setting a, a price at which it's sold, a, a, a maximum price, whereas in the past we really set a minimum price, a floor price. Uh, and so that, that, that will have to be looked at. Um, but really that will affect older contracts rather than newer ones. And we do have to consider what's the effect on, uh, on investment and our competitive position against other European countries. Um, yesterday, you will have seen there was a cabinet meeting, and the government decided that uh, on, a, on a demand response on what they were going to do to limit the public sector's energy use. And really part of that is about making sure that we are practicing what we preach, that we're turning down the thermostats in our own government buildings, turning off power earlier in the day. And that also has to extend into the corporate sector. 
So you will be aware that the CRU has issued new tariffs for large uh, electricity consumers. And they've come to me and they're shocked and upset, but everybody has to do their share. And that includes the corporate sector. So there will be, we will charge more for large uh, corporates who are using a lot of power during peak hour. Um, you know, we've had, we've had with the last crisis, we've tried to flatten the curve, and this time we'll be trying to flatten the peaks. Uh, and if we can do it in really what was very, very challenging last two years, of course, in a life and death situation, and we, we, you know, we took very, very dramatic measures that involved shutting down entire sectors of the economy, and yet we managed to get through it. And it's for that reason that I think that we can get through this winter and the next winter as well, that we can overcome um, you know, what, a, a problem that is caused by a malign enemy this time rather than a virus, but we can make it. Uh, if, we can, if we can do it the last time, we can do it this time. But what is key to that is very clearly explaining to people why we're doing it uh, and building a, a, a sense of, uh, of solidarity and common purpose. So thank you very much, everybody. I'm um, delighted to, to have the opportunity to speak to you on what is really the major, major issue of the day at the moment, a great national challenge for everybody. Uh, and I would be delighted to speak to any of you if you contact my office in person afterwards if you want to discuss things with me then. Thank you. Oh, do you want to ask like, I do, I do, I do, I do. Uh, do you want to take a seat there? Fortunately for you, we only have time for about two questions at the most. Uh, I want to ask you a question in the, the short term and then a question in the middle distance. Uh, first off, as we are here talking about energy security, um, can you talk to me about energy security, please, in a world where the most Brexity of Brexiteers, Jacob Rees-Mogg, is now the person who holds the energy portfolio in the United Kingdom? So uh, our, our connection with the UK is vitally important for a number of reasons. Our um, three quarters of our gas comes from the UK. We have uh, a land border with UK jurisdiction, uh, and we, ha we are trying to build um, uh, an overland um, electricity connection into Northern Ireland from the Republic, which has been the subject For of many 14 years. years now, yes, yes, which has been the subject of, and which is vital so that we can balance our electricity north and south of the grid. And you know that the grid is, is unified at this stage or run by the sa same organization. Um, so our connections with the UK, our, 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 our energy connections with the UK are absolutely critical. And that's why it is so important that we maintain good relationships good diplomatic relationships with the UK, no matter who is in power, and no matter what kind of rhetoric is used, that we never slip into you know, uh, the old ways and seeing, seeing, seeing the British as the enemy. We have to work with them because we are codependent. And in your experience, is the rhetoric that we hear in public very different to what's happening behind closed doors? I can tell you that at, at official level, there have been really, really close contacts, and that's never, ever slipped. So when you're thinking about, for example, the, the chief medical officer in the Republic and the chief medical officer in the North or the, you know, the, the chief information officer or something working together, you find that, in, in fact, at, at official civil service, um, NGO and agency level, there, there's, never been any, there's never been any loss of, 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 friend, of friendship. And in fact, a lot of it is just is, is rhetoric, people saying things for effect. My second question is the one that speaks most immediately to the, one of the themes of the motifs of this particular conference, and that is the planning system and the delays that we are currently experiencing. What can you tell me about the human resources that the government is throwing at, hopefully, the various bodies like on board Planola, SEAI, the new maritime uh, regulatory body, which hasn't even started recruiting yet, as far as I know, can you offer any kind of reassurance about the numbers of decision makers that are going to be in the key roles in the years ahead? I can tell you that the, uh, the budget it will be made in sort of three and a half weeks from now, and that uh, I, I, I can tell you that the, the agencies like Board Panola will not be underfunded, that there will be sufficient people, as you, can, as you know, the, other, the, second, the second most important issue for government at the moment after the, the cost of energy is housing. And so housing has the same uh, critical point. It, it needs people to make, to make decisions. And the decision-making um, ability of Board Panola has been under political pressure recently, let's say. So we, we, need, we need to strengthen them. And we need to give them... That's we need to make very sure gentle and resources, delicate euphemism. I think. Well done. <laughs> the resources, they will not be constrained by resources anyway. All right. OK, ladies and gentlemen, Minister of State, Hushin Smith, thank you very much indeed. Now... 
It is my very, very great pleasure to introduce to you, as I said, somebody who you're going to be hearing an awful lot of over the course of the next decade, somebody who is really quite a dynamic individual. Um, she is going to talk to you about green hydrogen. The reasons that she's here are going to become very, very evident. One thing that she won't do, one thing that has impressed me most about her and I think is something that everybody needs to be thinking about in their their hiring choices in the next while is that Catherine Sheridan, the person that you're going to hear from now, has a foot in the public service and a foot in the private sector, working now in the private sector, and speaks both languages. And that is going to be absolutely key to how it is that we get over these friction points in the climate action agenda. So, Chief Operations Officer with EIH2, EI Ireland, H2 Hydrogen, Catherine Sheridan. Thanks, Philip. So if I go to here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks very much to Owen and all the team in Mason, Hayes and Curran for giving me the opportunity to join today. I actually paid Philip for all those kind things he said about me, but he forgot the most important one, that I'm from Cork. So, I, <laughs> so look, I'm delighted to be here today, and it was great to hear from our minister in relation to the esteem that the topics that we're discussing today are being held with there and um, Cyril who you'll hear from later has a fantastic turn of phrase that hydrogen and energy is in everyone's mouths it's on our minds it's all we're thinking about so what I'm going to do today is speak about the role that green hydrogen can play in providing energy security in a net zero world and I'm going to start with uh, an overall view of what I'm going to talk about today so great news, everyone. Ireland can have an independent, secure and affordable energy future. Back to your first year uh, science class. Um, energy can be created or destroyed, but it can be changed from one form into another. In Ireland, what was previously a hindrance, being an island on the edge of Europe, is now our strength. We have an abundance of wind in Ireland. In fact, in terms of energy, we've probably got about eight times more energy than we could ever use here. It's in the form of wind. So we can convert that wind energy into electricity using wind turbines. We can use that electricity on the grid instantaneously, and we can even store some of it in batteries for short-term usage. But better again, we can convert that electricity through a process called electrolysis. Nothing new. Again, it was on the first year curriculum for science. I know this because I was helping the lads, my twins, do their homework last night, and it was part of their, um, their, their, their homework about the electrolysis. You pass electricity through water, H2O, and you separate the hydrogen out from the oxygen, so we can use it there. We can use electricity and green hydrogen to meet our domestic energy needs, and through energy export, we can play a role as one of the proud EU27 through supporting European energy system integration. But that's not where we are right now. Today, we depend on imported fossil fuels. So the Nerd Bible is the SEAI report, Energy in Ireland. It comes out every year and it tells us where we're getting our energy from and where we're using it. So this graph shows you how we're getting our fuel, our energy that we use in transport and heat and industry. And you can see that big, massive navy one, that's oil. And then the next one is the green one, which is gas. We're importing our fossil fuels and that's what's running our country today. So if we go back to the baseline and we think about electricity and meeting end energy needs from electricity, if we were to translate that into emissions reductions, if we had a 100% renewable electricity scheme uh, or electricity supply throughout the island of Ireland, we'd only reduce our emissions by 16%. So that's the first thing I'd really like you to take away from today. Electricity and energy are not synonymous. When we talk about achieving our goals in electricity, we always have to look at what's known as the elephant in the room, heating. How can we decarbonize heating? That's not to say that electricity isn't a massive part because it's an energy vector. Ireland's energy will play a crucial role in a net zero 2050. So this is the real map of Ireland. It shows the area that we have as citizens. This is our country. Most of it's actually underwater. But that means that the resources that we have and the wind turbines that we could install there and that we could capture the energy from could be used not only in Ireland, but also in supporting Europe as it transitions. And I'll talk more about the role of Ireland's energy 
in a new energy map in a minute. Sure, look, poor renewable electricity, it gets all of the focus on it, but it can't do everything. Electricity is brilliant, but it's really difficult as an electricity format to, or as an energy format. See, I did it there. We're so used to mixing up electricity and energy, we all have to kind of really stay on our toes for that. So it's difficult to store and transport energy in electrical format because you need to use it instantaneously to close the circuit and your batteries are really small. Anyone who's got a Xbox controller knows how often you have to change batteries. The technology isn't far enough along. So at the moment, we meet that need through fossil fuels. Our oil, our gas, our coal, our woods out the back of the houses, we store energy and we transport it in molecular form. Then on the dull calm days, the Germans have a great word for it. They call it the Dunkelflauter, and that's the dark calm. So on those days, you can't have the renewable energy sources to generate electricity. It's intermittent. You need to back it up. We do that with fossil fuels today through thermal uh, generation. And then there's the different phrases that we use to talk about the non-electrifiable energy needs. Sometimes it's called the difficult to abate sectors. I like to think of it as the things you can't plug in. So you can't plug in ships, they're using bunker fuel at the moment, which is rotten. And then you've got aviation, which is using e-fuels. And you've also got things, we mentioned the, energy, or the housing crisis. We need cement to build homes. To make cement, you need a high heat, which can't be met through electricity. All of those needs are met in our energy system today using fossil fuels. But the great news is in the future, they could be used, but they could be met using green hydrogen. So if you're sitting here in the room and you're going, oh, there's a couple of things I don't know about hydrogen, I've got two slides here, hydrogen 101, that will just fly through it and it'll catch you up. So hydrogen is the most abundant uh, element in the universe. It's the H in things like biomethane, CH4, that when we burn, we use the hydrogen for the energy, and then the C combines with the O, your carbon dioxide, and that gets released. It's in front of all of us. Everybody got a sample of hydrogen today. It's just bound up with oxygen in your H2O. When we use green electricity, so electricity from renewable sources, to separate out that hydrogen from the oxygen, that's called green hydrogen. There's a whole bunch of other colours that you could learn about if you want, but in Ireland, our resource is wind, our resource is renewable energy, so that's why we're going to have a green hydrogen strategy. So in relation to the costs associated with hydrogen production, and also how is that going to fall over time, Think about your flat screen TV or your cathode ray tube that you used to have and then you got a flat screen TV and it was really expensive and now you've got a smart TV. Technology costs reduce over time. We've seen that in the renewable energy sector through turbines and also through solar panels. That's going to happen for hydrogen production. And in parallel, the cost of renewable electricity is going to go down. So you've got your technology and you've got your electricity. They're going to transition over time. Doesn't mean we don't have to support it. A couple of decades ago, we started supporting renewable electricity from wind. We need to do something similar for that. So is it dangerous? Frequent question that's asked. So hydrogen is non-toxic. So, you know, if you ever, you know, spilt diesel when you were doing, or uh, two-in-one when you were doing the, the lawnmower, you know, you see that smell and it's heavy. Hydrogen is non-toxic. It's 14 times lighter than, the, in air, than air. And it's actually been in production for decades. So we have the expertise in it. We just need to transfer using hydrogen in a different way. So unlike other things you might have heard in relation to hydrogen, electrolysis is separating the hydrogen from oxygen at room temperature and at normal atmospheric pressure. So the production of it isn't at high levels. And then when we transport it, similar like you'd separate your diesel in your car, you'd separate your hydrogen in a specialized tank you take the hydrogen, you introduce it into a fuel cell, and that's what generates your electricity. So we have a broken energy system today that is not providing us with security, affordability, or sustainability. We have the resources that we could need to transfer that through renewable electricity and with uh, green hydrogen. If we look at the energy system of the future, this is a lovely graphic from the 2020 uh, European energy system integration strategy that came out. And what it talks about is thinking of all the energy in silos. So I've got oil and I'm going to use that to make diesel and I'm going to put it in my car. And then I've got coal and I'm going to burn it to make electricity. We start bringing everything together. So one example is on demand side planning. Or even if you think about it on a more personal level, an electric car. So we're electrifying the need, we're charging it up, and we're storing energy in our car. So if we could line that up so we're doing it at times of low demand, we can have this energy system integration. But the big one is you need to integrate 
electricity and molecules. So you need to, wherever you need a molecule, like your thermal generation or your system services for electricity that's using fossil fuels today, you need a new zero carbon molecule in the future, and that's green hydrogen. So Ireland has an opportunity to create a new map. Green hydrogen can support us in that. On the left, we have the Repower EU plan, which is quadrupling the appetite or the ambition for hydrogen. There are import pathways that they're talking about and sure, poor Ireland, with all our wind, we're not on it, but we could be. And while we have neutrality when it comes to our uh, troops, what we could do is we could impact geopolitics on a global scale by creating a new source of energy to supply the needs for countries like Germany, who are going to be importing 80% of their hydrogen. And instead of protect, perhaps taking the risk of a new form of colonialism, where we in industrialized countries are unfair on those countries who are catching up by stealing their sunshine and their wind, we could have Ireland, a democratic country, providing a new source of energy into Europe. On the right hand side, we've got the European hydrogen backbone, a dedicated hydrogen pipeline that's going to transport energy all around Europe from sources to sinks. So, you know when you're sitting in traffic and you're going, God, I can't get home, I need to get home in time. And then you turn around and you realize, hang on, I am traffic. We are the energy sector. Everyone in the room here is the energy sector. It's not a case of us and them. We must move away from this idea of saying, they should fix this, they should fix the planning system, we should do that. We all need to do it together. We need to start where we are and do what we can. We can't pretend that fossil fuels aren't going to have an ongoing role in providing energy security and meeting our energy needs in the short term. We're grown-ups. We have to accept those ugly truths. We need to develop and implement ambitious policies. On Friday, the consultation process for the hydrogen strategy closed. And what we need to do now is we in the energy sector need to get together and support DEC as they translate that into actions in the Climate Action Plan and also in next year's update on the National Energy and Climate Plan that they'll be submitting to Europe. We do need to resource public bodies appropriately, but we also need to foster collaboration. So there's a lot of representative groups. I'm involved with a lot of people in the room in relation to Wind Energy Ireland, Engineers Ireland, Hydrogen Ireland. We have fantastic opportunities to work together to create this new future, and that's what we're doing. What we're doing is we're not letting today's status quo dictate our energy future. We're creating a new one, we're not tweaking it. So I'm married to a New Zealander, and we had a very understanding status quo of what happened in the world of rugby. Ireland played, we were great, and Dean supported them when they were playing. But as soon as it went to New Zealand, things changed. This year, Ireland went to New Zealand and beat them. I'm goosebumps now. Ireland went to New Zealand and they beat them. And in part, it's what Paul O'Connell advises us all to do. And that's to be the best at things that require no talent. Collaboration, conversation, and working together to create the new energy future for Ireland is something that we can all choose to do today. And I call on everyone to join us in doing it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, worth bearing in mind that, yeah, the hydrogen's moment has arrived. Unfortunately, we still don't have a hydrogen strategy. In fact, I think the consultation process for that might actually still be ongoing now. Um, okay, I want to do something, uh, a little bit of fun before we proceed to our first panel, and that is to get you to pick up the phones, which you've hopefully downloaded the apps to, and answer the first uh, of a number of questions that we're going to put to you. Scan the QR code in there quickly if you haven't done it yet and answer this question for me, please. Will a windfall tax on energy companies have a negative impact on future investment in renewable energy? Now, I think the result in this room is probably something of a foregone conclusion on this one, but step outside of yourselves for a moment, if you will, please, while you contemplate this. I suppose one of the key issues that does actually have to be borne in mind here is that I just reminded myself of this morning, it is actually only three months since uh, all of the wind turbine manufacturers wrote to the European Commission and said, you have absolutely no idea how much trouble we are in trying to fulfil contracts uh, which were signed up to uh, as much as two years ago now. So please bear that in mind in any of your future taxation policies. So, if you've all done your pressing of buttons there, 
Are we in a position to get an answer on this? Will a windfall tax on energy companies have a negative impact on future investment in renewable energy? Oh, a more even split there than I thought there was going to be. 56% yes, 45, 44, 45% no. Okay, let us move on, please, to our first uh, panel of the morning. You can all start coming up here now, please, to be shepherded by Owen Cassidy. Let me put one figure in your mind that I think that is, provides the overall context for the problems that the offshore wind energy industry faces right now uh, in uh, actually getting the job done. We have 28 gigs of wind energy, offshore wind energy output in Europe at the moment. We have promised, the European governments have promised 160 gigs by 2030. That's a six-fold increase. Everybody else is chasing the same points in the supply chain that we are to. That is going to cause an awful lot of pinch points, an awful lot of crunches, and it's going to be the big challenge of the next eight years and beyond to address. So. Uh, on Owen's panel are Barry Kilkline, Head of Offshore at SSE Renewables Ireland, Vanessa O'Connell, Head of Inish Offshore Wind, Lova Suis there, well obviously, sorry, Vanessa, we know, Barry, John Salazar, Founder and CEO of Gazelle Wind Power, and Deirdre Nagel, partner in Mason Hayes and Curran as well. Owen, all yours. Thank you, Philip, and um, thank you, everyone. Um, so, very topical, um, and... Uh, as Oisin Smith and Catherine Sheridan, Mr. Oisin Smith and Catherine Sheridan have already pointed out, uh, where is Ireland going to get its energy independence from to avoid situations that we're in now and situations that we had in the 70s, situations that we had in the 80s and the 90s of the Gulf War with uh, energy crises? And the solution is, is the offshore wind opportunity that, that, that's here in Ireland. Um, joined by uh, fantastic panellists, Two offshore developers who, who told me they're not going to fight with each other over uh, locations in the coast. But, and then John Salazar from uh, Gazelle, um, who will tell us a little bit about it, their story. And our very own Deirdre Nagel from Mason Hayes and Kern, um, head of our planning and environmental team. Um, before we get into sort of the general discussion, um, the week leading into the conference, we asked all of the attendees to complete a pre-conference survey. Slightly unusual to ask people to complete a survey beforehand, and, and I'm t I was told to kind of keep the results under wraps until after the conference, but I'm going to break that rule. Um, and I want to actually focus in on two of the questions that are obviously relevant to, to our panel and get the views from the panelists now, as we have everyone here, um, as what they think about, about the results. So um, the first sort of offshore question we asked is, what do the what do you think is currently the greatest challenge to offshore wind delivery in Ireland? And we asked everyone here to rank those in order of priority uh, for where one is the most serious challenge and seven is the least serious challenge. Okay? And there's probably more than seven challenges, but we think we, we captured the, the, the ones that were most, most important. And the results, the results actually aren't that surprising, but there's a little bit more behind them, I think, that would be worth digging into. So planning risk came out just a little fraction ahead of grid infrastructure. Um, then came regulatory uncertainty, then supply chain issues, then staffing and, res and resourcing, then securing finance, and then, then uncertainty as to level of compensation. Um, now, I wouldn't mind actually turning to you uh, first, Barry, to, to give your view on this. Like, you know, are people underestimating the difficulties of other aspects and challenges purely because planning and grid are the ones that we're facing right now? I, I, I think to some extent they are. Um, oh, and I think the answer to that question is all about uncertainty and removing uncertainty in the environment. Um, so the first phase of projects, phase one, uh, hopefully they're going into a, an auction middle of next year, but they're carrying with them a huge amount of uncertainty. Not only are they carrying planning risk into that auction, but they're also carrying uncertainty around firm access, around air grid zone M policy, um, you know, and around things, you know, fun, fundamental financial aspects like indexation and how indexation is going to be treated. 
and all of that sums up to um, a very challenging landscape for shareholders and for investors. And I think that's one of the things that we may go into a little bit more yeah. detail later, but that, that's one of the things that I think we need to address as an industry. The known unknowns, as Donald Ronsfeld might The known say. unknowns, yeah. you know, because we, we can, we have the power to be able to deal with some of them. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to deal with the unknown unknowns, but let's, let's try and address the challenges that we can. And, and Catherine, would you, would you agree with, uh, sorry, Vanessa, would you agree with the, um, would you agree with, with, with that view around planning a grid? Is that, you know, as, as a developer, is that what you're seeing? Yeah, that, that is top of the list for sure, but I think it comes back, I think it's, it's on the list, it's, it's actually the implementation and delivery. So I think we're seeing really good signals in terms of the policy and on, on the grid. And I think it goes back to the sort of the certainty point as well, but it is that delivery point is, um, you know, where, where are the resources to actually deliver on this? You know, we haven't delivered offshore wind since the original Arco Bank project. So I think that we need to give confidence to the market um, yeah, to, to the international market as well, that we actually can deliver. So it was actually comforting to hear Ushing saying today from an onboard Planola perspective that resourcing will not be an issue. I think now it's like, it'll be great to see it. And then I'll also say back to, you know, Catherine's point, it is then about working together to deliver. So I think for me, that's probably where I sit coming from the offshore wind industry in the UK, where I was working there for the last 10 years. So lots of projects being delivered that's where I sit nervous. It's like, can we deliver and how can we actually give that confidence that we are going to, we are, we are going to be able to do that? Yeah. And, and John, as not quite as an outsider looking, looking in, but like, you know, you're not in the, in the weeds and detail on grid and planning. What do you see as the, the biggest challenge in Ireland? On well, my thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, if we want to tap into the power, the available wind resource in the south and the west, then we need to go floating. We need to tap into floating wind. And for that, we need to go beyond 60 meters in depth from the surface level of the sea uh, to the bottom. And uh, as of today, uh, in no way, shape, matter, or form, I see a local supply chain ready for doing that. Bear in mind that um, the trend is for wind turbines to be as tall as skyscrapers. We are going for wind turbines that are 285 meters, 50 megawatt, 60 megawatt. And we need to keep this stable and we need to keep this floating. So where are we going to manufacture these floating substructure that are massive? Where are we going to do the assemble? Who's going to provide all the service operation vessels? Uh, who's going to uh, give the o &M necessary for tackling this? So there are massive opportunities as well uh, from a supply chain point of view. And for sure, I agree that policy is key to foster the investment and, and catch up with that supply chain. And, and Deirdre, when you're you know, being approached by clients, you know, that, that uncertainty, is, you know, is that... Is that causing concern. It's very hard as a, as a lawyer to advise in an uncertain environment, but... It is, it is. But, um, I think uh, a lot of the issues are stuff that I suppose, from an industry perspective, you think is just eminently practical to be done. For example, turbine technology moves on. If we, if we can build, say, five megawatts today, will we be allowed, in, by the time we build this out, be able to build seven megawatts and things like that? So... I suppose a lot of it is maybe the legal system responding to those issues and there's necessarily a time lag as a result. But I think a lot of those issues are being understood now by government and relevant departments and you'll see them now starting to feed their way through to legislation. And tackle them. And then, so then I, I wouldn't mind actually just the second question we asked everyone and I'm going to get a really quick response from you guys on this is whether you agree or disagree with the balance of opinion in the room. So you're a very pessimistic group out there. Um, so we know that the, the target by, for 2030 has been increased from five gigawatts to seven gigawatts of offshore wind. And we asked you, you know, how do you view this challenge? Do you view it as realistic and achievable? Do you view it as challenging but achievable? Do you view it as extremely challenging but potentially achievable or completely unrealistic? And um, 30, almost 30% of you view it as completely unrealistic. Uh, over 40% view it as extremely challenging. So you've got 70, over 70% in the room, you know, really don't think we're going to get there on this very vital uh, target. So would you, I mean, yes or no, are you, are you in that 70%? Look, I'm not going to give you a yes or no answer, but what I will... <laughs> That's what, what I, I asked for, Mary. <laughs> what I will say is, look, we, we welcome the 7 gigawatt, the increase of 7 gigawatt, uh, something that SSE Renewables were calling for. We also welcome the 2 gigawatt of hydrogen um, and we hope that that's linked to an emerging realisation, back to Catherine's point, that in the 2030s, the Irish grid is going to be saturated 
it will not be able to take any more power. So we need to look for an alternate mechanism to transport that energy. Back to your point, Owen, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Do you know, uh, we're hoping to have an auction for the first phase of projects middle of next year. There's a huge amount of uncertainty associated with that. Uh, we're hoping to allocate seabed for uh, phase two projects next year as well. There's a lot of work to be done there. And rolling on to the phase one projects, it's unlikely that they will be submitting a planning application until the end of next year at the latest or at the earliest. When are they going to secure planning? And, you know, you can do the sums yourself in terms of it takes about four odd years to deliver one of these projects once you, once you reach financial close. So 2030 is going to be really challenging. Vanessa? Yeah, I'll agree with everything that's been said, but I think for me, I think we get a little bit focused on the targets. You know, it's a number. It's a nice, well, actually, it's not a nice round number anymore. It's gone from five to seven. <laughs> so, so maybe we're moving away from that. But And 2030. So I think it is obviously important to have targets and have a, a sort of direction of travel and be moving towards that. And I think increasing the target just increases that level of ambition. So everyone in this room today is now maybe more energised to say, it's not five, okay, now we've got to get to seven. But whether we reach the target or not, I think the really important thing is that we have really got moving. We've got a number of projects that are commissioned in construction and we're moving towards that net zero target because ultimately that's the goal. So I think I, I'm not going to say whether we're going to make it or not. I don't think anyone knows if we're going to make it or not. I think we all have a view right now sitting here today, you know, where we are now. But we know the huge challenge that's in front of us and that we all need to move. And I think I'm incredibly optimistic. I'm going to stay optimistic. That's who I am. We all need to be optimistic because we have no choice. We have to get to net zero. So whether we make the 2030 or not, I think it's maybe something we just shouldn't focus on too much because I don't think that will be a measure of whether we've succeeded or not. I think the question, Owen, you, you may have wanted to ask is, can, back to the point that you made, can we afford not to make the 7 gigawatt target? And I don't think we can. You know, we've had our, our homework marked there, uh, was it this week? We got a C down from a C, C plus last year. Um, and, you know, there seems to be a misalignment between climate ambition and climate action. We need to fix that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm an entrepreneur, so I, I dream big. I think big, of course. Um, now, um, it's a matter of mindset. It's a matter of we, we cannot continue playing not to lose. To achieve these type of targets, we need to play to win. There is a big difference in, in playing not to lose or playing to win. So uh, that's, that's necessary. It's necessary a sense of urgency. There are challenges, as we alluded before, from a policy point of view to have that certainty. But there are huge also uh, challenges from a technical point of view and supply chain point of view. So this is, this is a, a wake-up call for all the business owners in the audience, all the influential people. That, that war mindset is necessary in order to achieve that type of goals in such a short time. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think you know, Philip hit the nail on the head when he just talked about the international competitive environment that, that, that we're being faced with here. And, um, you know, and, we're, and we're competing with more mature offshore markets, with better structured supply chains, heavy industry, port infrastructure than we have. So, like Barry, I think just you know, to make Ireland a more attractive location... Um, for delivering offshore wind in the short term, um, it, you know, is the answer trying to make offshore wind in Ireland more affordable than it is elsewhere? And, and if so, how do we go about doing that? Th th there's, a, there's a couple of measures that we can take. So, you know, if you look around the room today, there's certain entities that are absent, um, you know, from the, from the supply chain. Um, that kind of goes back to the structure of the upcoming auction. So, you know, in other jurisdictions, you could put a bid in, and within six to nine months, you can achieve financial close, have contracts signed, and be steaming on to deliver your projects. Because of the structure of the auction that we're setting up here in Ireland, it'll be two plus years before, at, at a minimum, before contracts are signed post uh, developers you know, confirming that they're successful in res. And, and that makes us very unattractive for the, for the international market. You know, um, similarly, at the scale of the projects that we have, you know, the 800 megawatts of this world, is now coming to the point where they're small in an international context. So if you, if you layer all those risks upon each, upon each other and you have the supply chain look from the outside in, you know, they can focus um, their efforts on other jurisdictions where you know, there is an established route to market, there is 15 plus years of delivery experience, and they have a higher likelihood of success. So I, I, I think there is an opportunity now for us to structure the auction so that we're actually making it more attractive to the supply chain 
rather than the less attractive, which, which is what we're doing at the moment. So capital follows the path of least resistance. It does, it yeah. does. And, and uh, Vanessa, just looking at, say, your experience between, you know, what, what you experience in the UK, you know, which is the most advanced offshore market in the world, um, and comparing that to what we have in Ireland, you know, wh where do you see the supply chain deficits here and, like, what really needs to be prioritised by, by government? Yeah, I think, I think for me there's two elements when we, when we think about the supply chain. There is the international supply chain, which we've heard about from, from Barry and, and also Philip. I think we were listening to the, the same webinar this week. It's about, um, and Ireland's going to be reliant on that. We're not going to have, well, we may in, in time, but we're not in the short term going to have turbo manufacturers here. We're not going to have foundation uh, manufacturers here. So we need the supply chain to come, and that includes the, um, the, the, the vessels, the T&I contractors. So I think there's the international supply chain and then being attracted to the Irish market. And then there's Ireland build, build, building their own local indigenous supply chain. And that's important for a number of reasons. It's important to support the overall delivery of the offshore wind farm. It's helping build resilience into delivery of offshore wind in Ireland. And I think what's a really key point is actually um, you know, creating an industry here an industry that people are excited about and want to support, and it's giving jobs to you know, the, their children and their children's children. I think that is a fundamental point in terms of the overall sort of long-term support for offshore wind and, and the, these huge infrastructure projects being built uh, in, in our country, off our shores. So I think challenges for sure in terms of the international supply chain. I think there's targets for 160 gigawatts across Europe right now, up from, by 2030, up from 28 gigawatts today. So that's a six-fold increase from where we are today. Where is Ireland within that? We've obviously got our target, but again, you know, are they attracted to come here? And I think the, the solve to that is around the certainty. So I also took away that point, Jan Donald saying, saying to developers, if you want us to build a project for you by 2030, I'll say what Philip said again, you need to be making, entering to, into a contract next year. So for phase one projects, yeah, we've got, they've got a level of certainty. For the phase two projects, which are required to meet the 2030 goals, we don't yet have a timeline about when we're going to get site exclusivity. So for, for a developer to be able to enter into a contract, you need to know that you've got the land to be able to build that. So that's, that's really critical. And then I think from a local indigenous perspective, you know, we don't currently have um, a construction base here in Ireland. So if we look to other markets such as Scotland and the UK, you know, frankly, they have struggled to build a local supply chain. I think with the last look in, in Scotland, I think they had a 20% supply chain. But I think what you're seeing in the UK and other markets is, is the coming together and having a plan. So in the UK, they've got this target for 60% local content. And I'm not saying that's what we should have in Ireland, but I do think that we need to come together and have a plan. You know, we need to sit down together as developer, as government, and say, okay, what do we want and how are we going to get there? And that goes back to, to Catherine's point. She, you know, she's a woman after my own heart. I want to bang this drum again and again and again. It's not about government. It's not about industry. It's, and it's not about the communities all you know, dis disparate. We actually really do need to sit together, be building trust with each other over time, and then I think that's how we, we can succeed. And I think, so, so just kind of to sum up sort of two points, in terms of the international supply chain and, and getting them to come to Ireland, it's around certainty. So that's, you know, the O-Res auctions, it's having the policy targets, but it's also back to my original point, actually giving evidence that we are going to deliver. And then from a local perspective, I think it's about, um, yeah, it's about having a plan and focusing on our niches. So if we're saying, you know, we want to have a turbine manufacturer in Ireland, is that realistic? Is that actually what we want in Ireland? What do we want from a local supply chain? Should, let's focus on our niches. We've had a real great success in terms of um, attracting sort of the digital economy into Ireland. Is that where we want to play from an offshore wind perspective, using the, the, you know, the advantages that we already have in that space to both serve the, the Irish market and international? I think, John, it might, that might be a good intro for you actually to give a little bit of a background to Gazelle, because a lot of people in the room may, may not be aware of who you are and what you've done over the last few years? 
Uh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. So at, at Gesell, we are introducing the next generation of floating offshore wind substructures. As I was alluding before, uh, if we want to tap into the power of uh, floating offshore wind in the south and the west. We need to put um, wind turbines that can be as tall as the Eiffel Tower, over 200 meters in height, and we need to keep this uh, floating and, and stable. And uh, for that, it's very important uh, to use this type, this type of floating substructures. But to give uh, a bit of further context about what we are doing, and the, the reality, as Philip was saying before, is we are at a crucial point in humankind where we are transitioning from a fossil fuel reality to a decarbonized world. And this cannot be, as Vanessa was saying before, this cannot be simply for achieving uh, targets from a government or a particular corporation. This is a matter of survival, and this survival goes through the generation of renewable energy and the storage of that, of that renewable energy. If we look at offshore wind, the opportunity is massive globally. DMB is targeting, is forecasting 2 terawatt, 2,000 gigawatt in the next three decades. That's a multi-trillion euro market opportunity. If we only look at floating offshore wind, DMB is forecasting over 264 gigawatt. That's a total addressable market of over 500 billion euros. So it's very important for Ireland and for the local supply chain to not sit, not sit on the coach, not wait for that to happen. We need to go out, we need to get that expertise, we need to be um, on top of the main markets that, that are now uh, being developed, so then we can come back and we can de develop all these, all these projects. And that's exactly what we're doing at Gazelle. Um, the leading floating technologies will not be simply those floating substructures designed to float and survive. Everyone is assuming that that's going to float and survive over there, even in very rough seas. The winners will be those solutions that, are, that make sense from a CapEx perspective, we are, we are solving, we need to solve levelized cost of electricity. And if, if we summarize part of the discussion, we can identify, we were, we've already said, there is a policy challenge. We need the right mechanisms in order for this industry to really start, start taking up. We can learn from onshore wind. Onshore wind is a successful story in Europe, but it's also a painful one. It took a while for onshore wind to get to the levels where we are today. We cannot make the same mistake with, with offshore and with floating. So we should learn from that, put the right mechanisms uh, put in place that supply chain, so that certainty, again, is very, very important. And uh, I believe you, you put uh, great examples about what is needed and, and getting focus on those niches. And, of course, hand in hand goes the technologies. And that's why we are, we are seeking to solve. Uh, proud to be uh, headquartered here in Dublin. Uh, and to, to end, I, I recall the first time I was here in Dublin was when I was seven years old. I was with a lovely Irish family uh, learning English in Bray. And I recall that that's where I learned to, to play rugby and to, and to fight and to, and to learn English. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I recall looking at, at those Irish kids, I thought, whoa, these, these, these kids are fierce. My God, they are, they, are, they are not playing not to lose, they're playing to win. So that's the same attitude we need to all together in this room have in order to achieve this type of, of goals, the carbonization goals. Otherwise, it will be a missed opportunity. And, and let's not delude ourselves with this type of targets because we've already lost the opportunity. For instance, from an R&D point of view, uh, there is, I was in Stavanger last week, and, and, and you, can see, you can see floating technologies already uh, piloting there with all the investment and exposure that that's attracting, majors from oil and gas, renewable energy, renewable energy majors, why, why that's not happening here in Ireland? Why I need to take my, my pilot project to the Atlantic Ocean or to another place and I cannot deploy in Ireland? So we should ask ourselves these questions. So there is, there is an opportunity for Ireland to be an R&D hub if we make the right decisions and invest and put policy in place in the right way? No, absolutely. For us, uh, this is a very friendly business environment. We've got a, a modicum of success. We were, Gazelle was a success story from the European Commission uh, as we are moving very, very fast. We are one of the fastest moving companies in this, in this specific niche. Um, now, I I innovation will play a huge role. And uh, when you are starting, these type of initiatives are quite capex intensive. For sure, we need software to optimize the grid, but without hardware solutions, deep tech solutions that power and balance the grid, there is, there is no energy transition. You cannot, you cannot enable floating offshore wind if you don't have the right hardware. And that initially is very capex intensive and you need to move very, very quickly. So the role of, of the uh, SMEs in this room, the, lo the role of the startups is absolutely key because we can move forward very quickly, we can push that innovation and uh, surely uh, that R&D um, or, or that capital to increase the techno technology readiness level uh, to a commercial stage is absolutely key. And that's something that, um, if, again, if we don't have that war mindset, I was alluding before, uh, Ireland will, will miss the opportunity. The, the world is moving very quickly. And um, again, the, there are already countries uh, far, far ahead to deploying these technologies. Um, 
Talking of a war mindset, um, the w- one of the warriors in this group is is, is Deirdre Nagel, who's been battling the um, <laughs> planning objectors and the courts for a number of years on all kinds of various aspects of onshore wind and and on offshore sure challenges. But Deirdre, a lot of people obviously see consenting as being the major major risk for their projects. And you know what can be done in terms of reform in the short and medium term? Sure. Well, the first thing to say is that. There is reform taking place. So everyone's aware of the long and, and difficult birth of the Maritime Area Planning Act, but that has been enacted now. And it set up a, a, a huge uh, a change in Irish legislation in, in terms of having a consenting system in the Maritime Area. The government also is, uh, as you're aware, carrying out the reforms of the planning legislation, and that's currently taking place. And some of those reforms have actually already started. So I don't need to explain to anyone in this room uh, when I mention the Jerry Ad litigation and the uncertainty that created around design flexibility. So in July, this, there was an amendment uh, to the Planning Act introduced, which essentially allows um, developers to have discussions with planning authorities and the board to get their opinion on the level of flexibility that, that can be introduced in an application. And that will apply to um, offshore applications. And one of the reasons that you specifically can give for design envelopes is to allow you to avail of innovations and in technology. So I think that's, that's important. That's also something I think that is recognised at an EU level. So you'll all be aware of the Repower EU. And in terms of, I suppose, for renewable energy projects and grid connections, one of the things they said as well is that the consent systems must allow developers to be able to benefit from innovative innovations in technology post-permit granting. Um, so like that's, that will also uh, have to f- feature in. And another thing which I, I'm sure will be very welcome to everyone here is to provide for maximum timelines. So, I mean, like as, as Barry and, and, and Kat, uh, Vanessa have said, in terms of like reducing the kind of uncertainty, at least if you can, like if someone comes to me now and says, well, when, like how long will this take? And I'd be like, well, it says 18 weeks, but that's a notional target. And the reality is it's, it's, it's 18 months to two years. Whereas now there's going to be a commitment to like, have these um, consenting processes condensed, essentially, with maximum limits. So at least you can have some certainty for your projects in that regard. Yeah, I mean, certainty in programme is so key. Sorry. Well, no, I, and I, I think that's a really important point because I think it's important, for, particularly from a planning perspective, from an offshore wind pro, um, perspective, is 18 weeks. It, feel, it feels far too short. Mm-hmm. In the UK, it's, it's, eight, it's 18 months mm. for the DCO process, and they're now trying to reduce that to 12 months. So I think for me, that would be really welcome. It's about certainty. It's not trying to squeeze it all into 18 weeks, which is, you know, these significant infrastructure projects. It's just being realistic. So having a year, 18 months, at least we'd have certainty. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things in terms of like when we're like um, working through with developers about to how to kind of de-risk their projects. I suppose one of the things that can be done, and, and I, I, I understand the government tends to do, is to try and increase the quality of decision making. Mm-hmm. Like it's fanciful to say like a project will be consented like, of that nature in 18 weeks. And you, you clearly don't, that's adverse to your interest if they try to do that because they'll fly around the racetrack but knock every single hurdle on the way around. Mm-hmm. So um, I think uh, that's one of the things I think that uh, just needs to be factored in. Anything that we can do, because as much as it may be unpopular for me to say it in this room, judicial reviews are going to happen. There's, there's really no way out of them, I'm afraid. People are entitled to participate in decision-making. But what I suppose we can do is to make sure that the quality of decision-making stands up to scrutiny. And also that um, I suppose the courts have, you know, you know, more kind of things that they can do if they do find a flaw in decision-making, as opposed to just straight quash your back to the drawing board. And there is like going to be an increased focus um, on remittal of applications and entitlement for applicants to apply for remittal uh, in front of the courts. So it, essentially what will happen is, as opposed to it being quashed, the decision will uh, basically go back to the board again for basically reconsideration and effort to fix whatever flaw may have been identified. And like I think that kind of process 
like allowing the courts to adopt a bit more of a tailored approach will be very help, beneficial. Yeah, and, sorry, sorry just to come in on there, that's an example of kind of low hanging fruit that we within the industry's control, we, we can leverage. You know, other things like, for example, private wires legislation or private pipes legislation when we're thinking forward to hydrogen. They're, they're low-hanging things that we can, we can address now. So, for example, if private wires legislation, which the industry has been looking for for years now at this stage, was in place, it could have allowed developers to collaborate with large loads, to take them off the grid, reduce the overall cost of supply, and reduce the data center challenges that we have now. Other things, for example, like looking forward to 2050 and thinking that it takes 10 plus years to deliver these offshore wind farms. So if we do want our 30 gigawatts by 2050, we need to think about allocating 20 gigawatts of max in the 2020s, 20 gigawatts of max in the 2030s, and 20 gigawatts of max in the 2040s, because we're going to have attrition. And these things are within our control, and that will all bring about a level of certainty and comfort to the shareholders and the investors, which will increase the investment flowing into Ireland, which will encourage the likes of upgrades of small ports and maybe maybe not the turbine and the you know the large manufacturing facilities of this world, but smaller manufacturing facilities that allow us to tap into the Dungarvans of this world, uh, the Ross of Eels, you know, to set ourselves up for the floating offshore wind, you know, opportunity that is sitting on our doorstep. So I, I think it's focusing on you know those low hanging fruit and back to the point Catherine made, collaborating together and trying to identify what we as an industry can do to accelerate development and delivery. And it, as the Minister mentioned, there's the, um, the Offshore Wind Delivery Task Force, which the terms of reference have been issued. You know, like, do you see that as being, the, you know, creating that potential for collaboration and connected reform and joined up reform of all of the issues that need to be addressed? Yes. <laughs> No, I, I, I'm actually really excited about this yeah. because when, since I moved back from, from the UK last year, I have been banging a little drum around this idea of a sector deal, you know, in, in Ireland. And I think this is actually the beginning of, of that. It's starting within government. They came together, the cross-departmental group, and they are working hard. We haven't seen any announcements yet of, of deliveries, but from some of the conversations I've been having, they are working hard to sort of join the dots. And supply chain is a key element of that ports, it's planning. Um, I think biodiversity needs to be in there. We need, when we're building renewable energy projects, we need to be protecting, potentially enhancing the environment. So that, that is all in there. And what I'm hearing is, uh, and yet to be delivered, but I'm excited, and if there's anyone from government here today, obviously Ushing is here, love to hear more. They will be getting the industry involved. There will be subgroups, and there'll be subgroups for particular topics. And I think that's going to be really important, because that goes back to my earlier point of sitting around the table and sharing knowledge and expertise and building a plan and not just putting that plan you know, on paper, making a flashy announcement, actually then continuing to work together week by week, month by month, and actually have sort of accountability that doesn't just sit on the developer side, doesn't sit on the government side. It also should be bringing in relevant sort of environmental stakeholders and community, but that we're all working on it together and that's, there's that collective responsibility. So, yes, to your answer. It, it, I think we need to probably move pretty quickly because, we, you know, again, it's back to an emergency. But I'm, um, I'm optimistic of, of what I'm seeing and, and what the potential it's got for, for actually delivering on what we need to do. It's, it's always amazed me as a feature of the energy industry and just working with, with Wind Energy Ireland, like seeing uh, private developers and interested parties working together and sharing information and yeah. collaborating. I'm, I don't think you get it in many other industries to the same degree you get it in the energy industry. I think it's quite unique, and it's something that I think that yeah, the, the department and government should be should be grasping that opportunity to um, to, to to bring that forward and and leverage off you know the assistance support that's that's being thrown out there by um, by, by industry in, in the area. Well, I think the real success in the UK, and you, you've seen it, Vanessa, was the the collaboration with key players who could make commitments on behalf of developers in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So the Offshore Wind Industry Council and the sector deal. Yeah. And that really gave the, the impetus and, and things happened on the back of that. So, you know, it's absolutely fabulous to see the, the, the government task force, force coming together, but it's critical that they involve the key players in the industry who are in a position to make commitments yeah. that can be delivered upon. Um, and I think that's what brought about the real success of the UK offshore wind industry. Yeah. 
And I, and I think just to add, like, yeah, we are sitting, we are competitors, but we're also collaborators. And I think that's what's um, a great example of the likes of Wind Energy Ireland and these other trade associations is there is that recognition that, you know, you're out there playing to win, fighting against each other in this sort of rugby um, analogy, but then you're also then also, you know, you know where you guys need to work together. And ultimately, we only succeed if we, you know, work together. Yeah. So, uh, look, we're, we've kind of come to the end of the time that we have as a panel, but I think with, there's a few questions that have just come through on Slider that I wouldn't mind uh, raising, and I'm going to throw these out, and feel free to jump on the grenade, whoever feels like uh, they're their best place to answer. Um, so the, um, the first question is from, from Joe Hanley, and he said, the business case to use wind electricity produ to produce hydrogen, uh, conversion losses at every stage, including storage, how much of a kilowatt can be delivered at end of use? Now, that might be one for... Catherine, rather than for us. So uh, I don't know if you want to shout it out or if we have to, do we have a roving mic that's available? I've got my number three mic on. So oh, you still working. have your mic. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Super. Um, in relation to the role of hydrogen, um, we shouldn't be using it everywhere. Like, let's save energy, let's electrify, let's strengthen the grid, let's do everything. There's certain things that we need to use hydrogen for, and that's where we're going to have to bring it in. And then again, when we reduce everything down to money, we're dooming ourselves to short-termism. We have to consider what's happening. The cost of anything is the amount of life we exchange for it. So as we transition to a new energy future that's sustainable, affordable and secure, we're going to have to spend more money than the do-nothing option of continuing to burn fossil fuels. Yeah. Just to, to come in on that, you know, I, I think the question is absolutely bang on. The LCOE of wind or electricity in, in Spain is, what is it, the late 20s? It's probably the, the late 20s, early 30s in, in Sweden. It's probably the 50s in, in the North Sea. Do you know, there's a, there's a significant delta between those prices and where it is in onshore in Ireland at the moment. And you can then read that across to, you know, hydrogen and what the cost of production of hydrogen is going to be. But things are going to change in the next 10 years. And if we don't take action now, we're going to miss the boat yet again. And, you know, you only have to look to last week and the announcement between, of the link between Germany and Canada, where Germany has committed to buying hydrogen produced by renewables from Canada. Why was that not Ireland? Do you know, surely it has to be cheaper to ship from Ireland across to our, our, European, our fellow European Union members. It, that's, that's really an opportunity missed, I think, from our perspective. Um, another question then, I think, um, John, this is probably for you. When will floating turbines... Um, past fixed base turbines is the preferred technology in the offshore industry? So at the moment, you can see the price for floating wind uh, being uh, five times more than fixed. But, uh, most of the technologies are being piloted now. There are challenges from a, from a floating substructure. Um, some of the technologies out there are quite um, intensive from a CapEx perspective, which uh, impacts in the LCOE. Um, there are problems also with, with the moorings. You need to be able to make solutions that last for those 20, 25 years of operation. But the, the, the new generation, effectively, of technologies is, is coming out there. So you start seeing, for example, in the UK, you start seeing the first uh, commercial uh, projects towards, we'll start seeing towards the end of this decade, um, 26, 27, uh, seeking to uh, power or, or to, to lever on the old uh, oil and gas legacy structures, uh, we have a Scott Wind, to me Scott Wind, that was the kickoff of this industry. You can see how initially there were 10 gigawatt being planned, 1 gigawatt of floating, 9 gigawatt of fixed, and at the end uh, we end having uh, 25 gigawatt, where 15 uh, is floating wind and 10 is, is fixed bottom. So uh, also in relation to the previous uh, question, there are some places where there is no choice. There is no shallow waters. Um, here in, in Ireland there is a vast potential in the south and the west. Uh, that's going to take time. It will be the combined effort of many companies, as uh, Vanessa and Barry were alluding before. Uh, when we do, for instance, when we do a pilot project, that's the combined effort of over 12 companies. You need, uh, you need APCAs, you need the mooring, uh, the, the mooring system providers, you need, the, you need the engineers, you need uh, all the operational maintenance. It's a vast, it's a vast effort. But uh, we foresee uh, floating being competitive with FIX in some places towards the end of this decade. And for sure, the golden era of floating wind will be, will be in the 2030s. And green hydrogen will, not just in Ireland, but globally, it will, it will help to boost that demand of floating wind as it's one of the ultimate solutions to solve that energy, energy transition puzzle. Um, we've run out of time, but there is one last question I wouldn't mind 
giving to each of you, and I'm going to put you on the spot. It comes from, from an anonymous person who said, uh, what would each of you ask for, from government? You've got one, one request, one wish in the, in the lamp. I, I, I suppose that's threefold. Fix the indexation issue in ORES, index the CPI, take the low-hanging fruit and, and grab it, and look to the future. If we want 30 gigawatts by 2050, we need to start allocating max now, and we need to start allocating 60 gigawatt, gigawatts of max. So threefold answer. Sorry, Owen. Three, that's okay. Um, let's do it together. Do it together? Yeah. Okay. To me, innovation will play a huge role in addressing these this decarbonisation goals. And uh, SMEs in Ireland, uh, I believe, account for 99.8% of the, of the industrial um, core uh, in, in this country. So it's very important to uh, not forget about all the SMEs, not forget about all the, all the startups that are pushing uh, those new technologies that will enable the market. So access to capital at that early stage is, is fundamental because this, as I said before, these initiatives can be very capex intensive initially. So uh, piloting a floating offshore wind project can, can be a 35, 40 million euro project easily for a, for a small scale wind turbine. So, John, you're looking for 35 million euro. <laughs> <laughs> Minister, if you could just take so, a note, so, uh, no, no, note, note luckily, of that. We, we've been able to secure the funding successfully now, yeah. uh, getting all its private capital. So we've received zero, zero uh, um, support from uh, government authorities to do this. That's true, we, 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 we're moving forward very quickly. But uh, surely we want to scale up. If we want to pilot not just a two megawatt uh, project, we want to do 50 megawatt. Um, that, that, that requires uh, the combined effort of many, of many institutions. So um, not just startups, but SMEs have great uh, talent uh, in, in, in Ireland. Uh, when you look at engineering firms, when, when you look at th there is a lot of brain power, and we shouldn't forget about that. We should connect this with uh, institutions like uh, Vanessa's, like uh, Barry's, uh, so we can all work together. Deirdre, one request from government. Um. I think, yeah, anything that can be done to simplify the planning regime, obviously there's constraints. Anything that makes it clearer, easier to navigate. And I, I definitely think fixed timelines to allow certainty for developers, whatever way the, the cookie crumbles after that. Excellent. Okay, just wanted to say thank you to Deirdre, John, Vanessa and Barry. Um, hope you found that interesting. And I'll hand you back over to Philip. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I sensed there was a certain amount of the energy and the optimism went out of the room as that panel discussed the challenges ahead. So let me bring you the good news, lawyers in the room uh, at least. Uh, I heard an estimate during the week that each single wind farm that is built, whether off the south or the west coast, is going to require uh, somewhere in the region of 3,000 contracts for each farm. So you guys are going to be able to colonise your own planet B at the end of this process. <laughs> and good luck to you. Now listen, what I want to do by way of um, maximising uh, time efficiently is to bring the panel on stage while I throw uh, our next question out to you. We have very, very dynamic panels uh, assembled to address ESG issues. They are Peter Johnston, uh, partner in dispute resolution at Mason Hayes Curran. Murren Lynch, uh, Dr. Murren Lynch is uh, from the ESRI, where she's a senior research officer. Uh, Paul Carson, the managing director of Strategic Power Connect. And Professor Aoife Foley, Queen's University Belfast and editor in chief of Renewable and Sustainable Energy Reviews. Um, the question that I want you all to once again pick up your phones and have a go at answering, please, while they sort themselves out there, uh, is, can Ireland implement policy changes to avoid blackouts this and or next year? This is not into the future. This is what can government do in the short term? Is there anything or are we just in squeaky bum territory and hope that we ride it out? I saw how the, uh, the energy provider in California, I think it was, just two or three days ago, in response to an anticipated energy pinch point, sent out text messages to everybody in the entire state saying, please, don't boil the kettle, turn off the dishwasher, or whatever it is. And the graph of what happened to energy demand in that crunch period between 6 and 7 p.m. in the evening just went fell off instantly in response to a 
really quite basic and obvious suggestion. We're all in this together, folks. Please help us out over the course of the next hour or two. But the answer to the question, how do you feel about this now? Is there anything that Ireland Inc. can implement in the short to medium term to avoid blackouts this and or next year? And your feelings on that are? Uh-oh. <laughs> 78 to 22. Oh, sorry. Yes, there is things that we can do. I read that the wrong way round. Oh, that's good, all right, there is optimism. We'll get your suggestions, in fact, put them in in the, uh, in the chat and the questions now as to what it is that uh, you think can or should be done there. All right, uh, ESG, next. For me, as a lay person, coming to this issue uh, largely uninformed, the big paradigm shift of the last couple of years has been that I notice that business leaders no longer think about ESG as the either or of what do I do for the environment and will it allow me to continue to make a profit? Everybody now seems to be of a frame of mind where they realize, do you know what? Unless I embrace the sustainability agenda, I'm not going to be making money, I'm not going to be making profit. In fact, I'm probably not going to be here in 10 years' time. So, with that in mind, let me hand you over, please, for the next 45 minutes to Peter McLay, a partner in Energy, Mason Hayes. Curran. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Philip. Um, yes, now, um, as Philip says, I'm a partner in the, in the, in the team here. Um, my accent may give away my uh, origins, and if there's any strange dip in my performance over the next 45 minutes, I'd like to blame Catherine for... Uh, for um, reminding me of certain traumas that took place uh, in sporting fields uh, far, uh, far away a few weeks ago. But uh, anyway, ESG. Now, like any good lawyer, I began this, this, uh, this, this um, research for the topic uh, by seeking out a definition. So let me, let me share that with you. Um, environmental, social and governance. ESG takes the holistic view that sustainability extends beyond just environmental issues. It's a framework that helps stakeholders understand how an organization manages risks and opportunities around sustainability. Now, stakeholders, immediately there's an alarm bell ringing for me. For somebody of my age, uh, you, know, you might have grown up with the idea that a company has shareholders, and most of the company's duties relate to making as much money as possible for its shareholders. But we're introducing a new term called stakeholders, which I think is intended to be wider than, than, than shareholders. So it's something of a jolt, um, something of a, an expansion in our traditional conceptions of what a company is supposed to do and, and who the, the legal duties are owed to. Um, so already there's, there's some new topics to grasp and some new concepts to, to get one's head around. Now, certainly at a, at a, at a, on the coalface, ESG is undeniable. It's an undeniable factor in the market. Um, our own clients, our own prospective clients, are certainly making it clear to us that ESG is important to them, uh, not just in the sense of their own activities, and many in the room, most of us in the room, are probably quite comfortable that our own activities at least pursue the E element of ESG, but also our own activities in the other areas um, and in our own business activities outside of fee earning. So the E, S and the G are clearly of importance to the market. Um, now, the theme of the conference is, of course, um, energy security in a, a, a net zero world towards which we're moving. Uh, um, as Owen mentioned, we asked the audience a series of survey questions uh, prior to, uh, to assembling you all here, and we asked a couple of questions about ESG, and I'll share the first result with you now, and maybe share the, first, uh, the second result with you um, at the end of this, this panel. Now, the first result, and this is kind of to help define what we all think is meant by ESG, we, we asked the audience, what in your view should be the most, or should be the main purpose of ESG policy? And we set out four options, and we asked the, the, the crowd to rank them, and the leading two responses were the following. The first was to direct investment towards certain activities, and the second was reducing negative external impacts of business activities. So already there we have a clear presumption in the market, that ESG is meant to do something. It's not, not just meant to be a, not just meant to be a, um, you know, a flag to wave or, or something to, to allude to. People actually want ESG to have real-world effect. Now, when we come back to the current situation and the issues around energy security, because we expect ESG to actually work, 
we immediately have the risk. What if ESG is in conflict with, with energy security, um, both now and as we transition towards, towards net zero? So, you know, there's certainly a topic there worth discussing. Now, I mentioned earlier my, um, my, my conceptual issues around stakeholders. Who are stakeholders? Um, are, they a, are they a clearly identifiable group of people or are they a disparate bunch? Now, I've got my own disparate bunch of stakeholders assembled on stage and hopefully between us we can, um, we can shed some light on, uh, on, the, on the topic. I'm going to do things fairly simply. We've got um, the panel is called um, ESG uh, Risks and Benefits. Um, I'll probably go around the panel uh, three times. Firstly, to have some opening comments about what ESG means to them. Secondly, what they perceive as the risks. And, and, and finally, um, hopefully, some, some, uh, some encouraging remarks about how we can, well, we can you know, I guess, um, exploit the, the, the maximum benefit from, from ESG as we know it. Okay, so without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to the first area. What does ESG mean to each of our panellists? And um, I'm going to be slightly self-indulgent and start on a relatively familiar footing by calling upon um, the other lawyer on the panel uh, for, the, uh, for the first response, my, my colleague Peter Johnston. Uh, Peter, what would you say ESG means to you um, uh, from your own perspective as a, uh, as a commercial litigator? Yeah, thanks, Peter, and morning, everyone. I, I'm the risks element of, of, of the panel. Um, I suppose, look, you know, as an issue, it's grown increasingly of importance over the last few years for obvious reasons, and it's no longer really marketing spin, the ESG mantle. And, you know, it's moved as a topic into the boardroom and it's coming up all the time. And because of that, then you get lawyers like me involved. And, you know, as a, a disputes lawyer, a lawyer is generally, look, your job for your client is uh, to a large extent to try and, you know, reduce their risk. And the challenge with ESG is if, you know, and lawyers, we love a definition as Peter's already sort of intimated. The challenge, you know, if a customer or a client comes to you and says, look, our ESG credentials are great or industry leading, you're like, well, look, that sounds wonderful, but what does that actually mean? And particularly from a legal context, what does that actually mean? Where are your rights and obligations and all of this? So I think the way to unpack it is effectively to consider it as an umbrella term and to break down the environmental, the social and the governance elements of the ESG moniker. And if you look at the environmental element, you're looking at sort of energy law, you're looking at pollution, emissions, think dieselgate, the Volkswagen type scandals. If you look at the social, you're looking at sort of employee rights, consumer rights. And then you move on to governance then, you're, you're looking at sort of director's duties, company statements, um, you know, financial crime and fraud and that sort of stuff. But I think when you look at it at that umbrella level, it's important to understand that you know, these topics sort of intermingle. And if I could use the Dieselgate uh, case as an example, and I appreciate it as an extreme example, it's an unusual set of circumstances, but there you had a scenario where you had a company who had an environmental fine because they had this trick device in their car which allowed them to fiddle the emissions test. They got a massive fine from the EPA in the US. They have then fined throughout the world by various other regulators. And then you had the follow-on then claim from consumers. So you moved from your environmental pillar of your ESG to your social. So you had consumers, customers of Volkswagen all around the world sue them on these follow-on claims, effectively saying, well, I thought the car I was buying was this environmentally friendly when it actually transpired that it wasn't. And those cases are still going on today. So I think to your question, Peter, in terms of how I would consider it, it's important you take a step back. It's an overall umbrella term that has a number of pillars or functions that all then intersperse with one another. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, and in terms of, like, um, one of the issues I'm interested in is the level of compulsion that's attached to ESG. I mean, uh, my, my impression is it's something that, that companies, um, now, admittedly, it's, it's widespread already in, in the market, but it's not compulsory for companies to, to, um, to actually engage with ESG, is it? Or how would you view it? No, and I think that's, again, from the, from the risk side. At the moment, you have, certainly on the environmental side of the ESG, you see companies coming out with various statements in relation to what they're going to do. And, you know, they're voluntary statements. There's no legal obligation for them to do certain things. But the challenge for companies is when they make these utterances now, if they're in the future, there's a delta or a difference between what they say they're doing and what they're actually doing. That's where it causes problems. Mm. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, like, uh, I know that um, uh, Sean Keyes, uh, writing on the currency last year, mentioned that I think because of the voluntary nature, um, what ESG, one of it, the effects of ESG, and it's possibly an unintended consequence, is to kind of split the market between the ESG companies and the, the non-ESG companies. You know, the same bad stuff might be going on, but it's just a, 
you know, it's a subset of the, the market doing it. Um, and that's because, again, it's, um, it's voluntary in nature, um, which I thought was an interesting dynamic. Um, okay, well, maybe moving, moving, move, moving to, a, to a, maybe a systems perspective, um, uh, uh, Dr. Mirren Lynch, um, have you any observations or, or thoughts about ESG and, and what it means for, for the, uh, the current issues confronting the Irish um, energy sector? Yeah, so I suppose two things that jump out at me, especially listening to the previous remarks, is <coughs> the fact that ESG is um, kind of at individual company level, and then, as you said, the fact that it's voluntary. So the way that plays out from a systems perspective is you might have individual companies or indeed kind of actors, communities, whatever, um, that are very micro-focused and are looking to have their own activities and operations meet some, some set of targets, whether that's low carbon, zero carbon, whatever. However, that might guide the system, and we can talk about the electricity system, the energy system, the economy, whatever kind of macro system we want to conceptualize this through, that might guide the system to a suboptimal equilibrium. So either one where we don't get total emissions down as low as we'd like, or one where we do, but it's more expensive than it would otherwise need to have or been. Or less secure, maybe. Or less secure, indeed. So um, a lot of the research that I do is on integrated energy systems. And one example of a research project that um, was really interesting but really, really difficult was about electricity demand response from a wastewater treatment plant. Now, wastewater treatment plant operators are aware of the fact that they have some inbuilt redundancies in their plant, which means they can actually operate the plant a bit more flexibly while meeting all of the environmental standards on the effluent, so basically the water coming out is sufficiently clean, um, but providing some flexibility to the grid. But up until now, they had been figuring this out through the basis of, I'll pull back my, my kind of operations when the electricity price is high, I'll ramp them up when the electricity price is low. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to take that resource of flexibility from wastewater treatment plant, but see how would the system operator make best use of this flexibility? So in that case, what you might actually do is you might want them to ramp up their usage, not necessarily when the wind is low um, or when the wind is high, but maybe in order to avoid a unit shutting off um, and therefore avoiding that high shutdown cost and then the subsequent high startup cost. That's something that would never have fed through to the wastewater treatment company's balance sheet. They're never going to get that benefit of avoiding shutting off and then restarting a coal plant or avoiding shutting off and restarting a distillate plant and avoiding all the associated emissions. So I think trying to find a way to get from that macro level to the micro level is the challenge here. Um, and then the market splitting that you mentioned as well feeds into that as well. The fact that it's voluntary, it means that companies that are opting in may actually be less able to do something for the system than some of the companies that are opting out. So yeah. we may be missing low-hanging fruit. And I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but um, you know, to me, um, from my remove, um, a system that's currently designed to, um, to, I mean, to emit carbon, let's face it, transitioning to a system where there's a, zero, a net zero constraint um, is a huge technical challenge but, but it's a system challenge, um, and I, I can't imagine how you do that uh, without some firm top-down guidance um, from, the, from the system and the operators and, and the, um, you know, the licensing authorities. Um, and yet, uh, you know, as, we've, as we're grappling towards a, a definition, it seems that ESG is more of a bottom-up. So it's, to me, it's kind of marrying those two, those two dynamics. Um, exactly, and you need to incorporate, I mean, from, if I were to model this, what I would be saying is I'd, I'd be looking at the incentives to participate in ESG and I'd be turning them into, I suppose, a constraint on the policymaker's problem. So the policymaker's problem is to get to whatever the carbon target it is, taking account of what everybody else wants to do. And if ESG is something that other people might want to do, then the policymaker has to include that in their problem solving. Otherwise, the solution that they arrive at and the policies, the enabling policies that they arrive at will not be fit for purpose. Right, so it almost makes it more complex. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, turning maybe to, to, to Paul now, um, who's coming from a perspective of a, of a, a company um, firmly aligned with ESG goals in, in the trenches, looking for projects, developing projects, and uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully you know, moving in the same direction as the, as the system requirements. Um, what are your observations, Paul, on, on ESG and, and what it means to you? I suppose at a macro level, I see... ESG being uh, really like a, a recipe. And if we get that recipe right, and if we have really high quality ingredients going into that recipe, I, I think to, to use a kind of a, an analogy, 
we, we will all get to enjoy a very good cake in the future, uh, as, as Philip refers to uh, the children and, and the grandchildren coming along. But it's very important that ESG is not just about renewable energy. It's, it's much, much broader than that. And, and I suppose that, um, you know, what I see is that um, ESG policies and strategies in companies are actually being developed in response to uh, funding and investment. And, and it really is coming from that top level down. And even though it, it may not be something that's um, obligated on a company, I, th I think that the changes in reporting that, that are coming down the line uh, this year and next year, where companies of a, of a scale need to report on their ESG policies and their, and their targets on an annual basis, I think it's going to be even more crucial. But when you bring it down to uh, re renewables, um, you know, we, we really do address the E, the S and the G, where we're uh, reducing carbon emissions through renewable energy uh, taken away from, from fossil fuel generation. Um, on a social basis, uh, we have a very good uh, system here where local communities can gain directly from the development of renewable energy projects. So, so that addresses the social piece. Um, on, on environmental, you also have the biodiversity piece, which is very important to renewable energy developers. And, and then on the governance piece, um, very topical in the last few weeks, it's, it's crucial that we address security of supply and energy pricing. And, and I think that that comes at the very top level of, of governance. Mm. Yeah, you know, well-made observation about the social elements of the, uh, the community-based uh, schemes that are, that are, um, that are certainly you know, present in the, uh, in the res, um, the res regime. Um, I suppose the uptake possibly with those hasn't been as much as the government might have hoped. I mean, do you have any reflections on why that might or might not have happened, or is it overly complex as a, a, a you know? I, I actually think the, the element within res for, for community benefit is, is very straightforward, and, and, and I think it's very helpful that it is straightforward. Um, but I have to say that above and beyond what might be stipulated in res, I find, again, going back to the collaboration that, that we heard about earlier between developers, uh, I genuinely feel that renewable developers uh, very much want to work with local communities. and We, we want to be yeah. a part of the community. We want to be good neighbours. And we want to share the benefits of any scheme with the local community. So I, I think it's much broader than what Res has set out. Mm, okay, yeah. yeah. Good point. Uh, Professor Foley, um, what observations do you have on, on, on ESG and, uh, and the, through the, the research you've been doing? Okay. Um, I suppose, look, I'm a, sort of a different animal in that I spent 12 years in industry, so I would work for Siemens, ESBI, SWS and PM. So I would have done a lot of this, um, but putting on my academic hat and then working with government, so working with the Treasury in the UK and stuff like that and DEFI up north and BES, to me it's more about de-risking impacts of climate change on markets and investments. So that's the first thing. That's the key thing. OK, after that, then it's about reorientating capital flows into sustainable finance, making it more mainstream and then having a long, a longer term investment. So then if we look at, say, green and brown funds yeah, and investments, the old sin funds, they're always going to make money. OK, so people are always going to gamble. They're always going to drive their car. OK, so if we're talking about green funds then and offshore wind, you know, it's it's great and hydrogen is great, but they're only a small portion of the market because we're locked into carbon until maybe 2075. So 2050 is a great target, but we're locked into, into you know, natural gas, we're locked into kerosene, we're locked into diesel oil, we're locked into a lot of products that we use at the moment. So then if we drill down further and we look at um, environment, social aspects and governments, to me the environment is the carbon market. It's IPPC licensing. It's traditional EIA, so the headache here for a lot of, like, I mean, I did wind farms, developers is EIA and dealing with the public, okay? But the issue there and where people run, run into difficulties is where they, they're a little bit fast and easy with the regulations or somebody makes a mistake in, in a planning application or somebody makes a mistake when they're constructing a wind farm after the fact. Um, they're the issues where you run into problems or you don't communicate adequately with the locals. So... I remember when I was in EISPI, I did one, it was a 220 to 110 kV substation and overhead lines. It was, it's actually for the IFA, so it's for the Irish-France interconnector. 
And it was the first time that a planning application had never gone to on board Planola for a high voltage power line in the history of the state. And I remember going down and I met the head guy in ESB, I can't remember his name at the time, and he brought me for pints in Foley's. <laughs> OK, so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, because actually what I did was I went and I spoke to every farmer, every landowner. And one of the guys who was going to object, he said to me, I don't want this running through my farm. Well, I said, I hate to tell you, Bosch and Lom isn't going to be there if we don't have this line. You know, and this is the honesty in the dialogue that you have to have with people. It's the same with the politicians in terms of then, say, um, you know, carbon, the carbon market. So at the moment, you know, um, carbon is trading at about 73 euros a tonne. So it's come down from 100 and odd, because basically what's happening is steel plants, aluminium plants, fertilizer plants has been, have been closing across the EU, so they're not going to exceed their IPPC license threshold. So there's going to be no need for them to buy carbon. But what's happening is then investors have moved into hedging in gas markets, so we have an Enron situation. They're making a lot of money very quickly. So that's actually what the key of ESG. It's not about really that the micro of hydrogen, the micro of wind. It's a broader, broader sort of strategic approach to investment. And yeah. that's what will make markets work. So what I'm hearing is that even, even in the days before ESG became a conference buzzword, on the ground you were behaving as if, you know, as, as people currently behave under, under ESG. It's nothing yeah. new in that sense. No, it's no, the, no, it's not. And it, like if you look at the social and governance aspects, and I said talking to the guys in the community. It's also about your investor, your shareholder, your board, your employees, and the community. So it's about happier people doing a better job in the framework of sustainability. So that's really what ESG is about, yeah. if you take a long-term sort of perspective. Yeah, and, and has always been about, I guess. Um, so moving to the risks associated with, with ESG, um, Dr. Lynch, uh, anything, anything to, or bothering you about the, about, about the concept? Well. I suppose getting back to the interface between ESG and policy um, and how do they interact and how, how do we craft policy taking the appetite for ESG into account um, and the fact that it's voluntary. One of the rules of thumb of policy, if you like, is you should have one policy per objective um, and that principle tends to get violated in both directions. So we like to have loads and loads and loads of policies to support one objective and then we like um, individual policies to support multiple objectives. So um, those who may remember after the uh, 2011 election, one of the, we, all, we always had kind of three pillars of energy policy, which were um, sustainability, affordability, and security. But job creation suddenly entered into the picture as well. And now every single energy policy had to also be crafted through the lens of job creation. How many jobs will they create? Because that election was all about jobs and it was a, it was a main um, policy plank of that government. Um, and then on the flip side, you, you kind of say, well, we want, to, we want to lower emissions. Might this here thing lower emissions? Yeah, probs. We'd better subsidise it. Without any... Um, without necessarily kind of consideration being given to how these various subsidies and schemes interact and undermine each other. So one really good example would be the fact that we had simultaneous targets for, we set really high wind targets in 2007, which we met in 2020. Um, but we also had other targets. So for things like a certain amount of um, combined heat and power. Now combined heat and power um, is great for lowering emissions, but it kind of works well when you have high electricity prices, but wind depresses electricity prices. So we're, we're coming up with two different policies um, to achieve the same goal, that of reducing emissions, that actually contradict each other. Mm. Um, so what I would say is, getting back to the ESG lens, it's important to make sure that whatever way policy is crafted, it takes account of what ESG is doing, it takes account of how ESG is steering investment um, and is directing activity. Um, and uh, policy needs to not um, repeat what's already happening voluntarily um, and maybe uh, drive investment in areas where ESG isn't touching or possibly find a way to compound rather than undermine the benefits of voluntary activity via ESG or other means. Mm. So I'd say that would be the, the main risk would come down to a lack of um, interaction in a, in a consistent manner between ESG and policy. Yep, so you'd have different policies conflicting with each other and also conflicting with the behavioural 
uh, trends that are that are evident, or, yeah. or the incentives at a, at, a, at a micro level. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, good observations there, um, Paul. Uh, from your perspective, uh, the risks, the, the downsides. How long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I suppose I I always say all economic development starts with planning, and I. I owned a planning consultancy in Belfast uh, from 2003, uh, so we've, we've dealt with it uh, for a long time now, uh, and transferred it across into renewables. And I, I suppose we're developing renewable projects at, at two different uh, scales. So we have utility scale where we have about 900 megawatts of solar in development and 800 megawatts of battery storage. And then uh, on the CNI side, uh, we're developing projects in partnership with large energy users uh, where we can supply uh, renewable electricity directly uh, with private wire behind a meter. Um, but, but I suppose in planning there really is a tension between the E and the S where we want to do something very positive for the environment but yet the social side in some locations is utterly against and you know it we, we have one project where uh, 110 megawatts of solar um, council has approved it, but uh, a handful of neighbours have sent it to the board uh, for a third party appeal. It doesn't help when six Green Party councillors support those objectors to take it to appeal. And, and that's where there's, there's definitely a conflict. Um, so we, we need more support on the G from from government to um, make changes in the planning process. Um, we, we have one project, which again, I think Deirdre mentioned earlier, about the, um, the, the guideline time of, of 18 weeks for onboard planola. We have one project with the board, it's now 57 weeks. But the, the problem with that is that it's still with the board and yet the ECP process for grid connections only opens once a year, and that's in September. So that project has now missed this year's application for grid. And if we are to get the decision from the board in the first week in October, the project has been delayed by a year anyway. So, so there's, there's no joined up uh, piece there. We, we need to have um, clarity in the process linking planning through to grid. And, and then even once you do apply into uh, ECP, uh, we, we secured the largest project in Ireland last year on the ECP batch list at 185 megawatts. And one year later, we still don't have a grid offer. So, you know, if, if the targets are there that we are all striving to meet by 2030, then we need to streamline the process. We need to get everybody resourced and working towards actually delivering the targets. I mean, Climate Action Plan, I think, came out first in 2019. How many of the actions have been ticked off and completed? Um, that, that's, that's what we need to get to, is actual delivery um, for, from government. And I suppose the, the, the REPAR EU paper, uh, which has been referred to a few times, it's really, really helpful. It, it, it sets the roadmap of how we should deliver. Um, but as the minister suggested earlier, 12-month approval uh, in designated areas, how long will it take councils in Ireland to designate areas? So that, that's the starting point. So th there, there are many, many issues and risks uh, that face developers in actually delivering projects. I think it's uh, nigh on impossible to convene a panel at a, an Irish energy conference without um, planning and grid uh, being mentioned, and, uh, and no exception here. But um, I mean, the, um, the devil's advocate in me would say that um, the planning system is an example of um, stakeholder capitalism at work, although I guess um, you'd probably complain that there are too many stakeholders allowed a, allowed a view, and often they're the stake is, is questionable. I, I've always been one for um, stakeholder engagement. Indeed, our, our planning company actually won a UK award for stakeholder engagement, uh, where we actually went out, as, as Eva mentioned herself, um, we went out and engaged directly with neighbours, and we still do that on, on each project. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, in, in some areas, you just will not get over, to put it bluntly, NIMBYs. Uh, and, and those handful of people are stopping a project which is bringing national benefit. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Professor Foley, have you uh, any, any observations at this point about the risks? Um, I suppose the risk is there's too many global standards at the moment. So if you look at ESG, it's a bit of an ad hoc. 
And it, um, you know, it, it's apart from the UK, um, it, it's 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 really voluntary. Um, so you know, you've the World Economic Forum, you've the UNEP principles for responsible banking, you've the Equator principles, you've the, the Global Compact, you've Net Zero Banking Alliance. There's just oodles of these, you know. So who do you who who do you saddle your horse to? Mm. So um, then the next thing is, you know, because there's so many of them out there, it, it's creating a bit of greenwashing. So, and then that then, what that does, then it gives the wrong signals to the market and then investors will complain about it and say it's an unnecessary, you know, bunch of paperwork, which lawyers will make a lot of money out of. Um, I think it really should be sitting more with the accountancy aspects of finance with some engineering in it, more of an ISO type standard. Um, you know, we, we can see it already with the UK Financial Regu Regulatory Authority. Like, I mean, um, the task force for climate-related financial disclosures now is mandatory, and that was done um, tying back into COP in Glasgow. And I, and I think that's really, really important. Um, and then if you look at sort of globally, and I, like, I mean, I've done planning applications in different EU member states and outside of the EU. And to be quite honest, the previous, one of the previous panel, I think she's a lawyer, for um, panel members, she mentioned really people have the right to object. And we live in a democracy. We don't live in Russia. Okay? So, you know, um, to be quite honest, I think it's the issue with energy projects and the issue with any projects is a bit, it's a bit like the Wild West at the moment. Okay? So everybody wants to fling a battery out. Everybody wants to stick a wind turbine up. And, like, I mean, at the moment, I'm involved in looking at um, offshore wind for Northern Ireland in the working group. And, you know, that process, is it going to be developer-led or is it going to be Crown Estates-led? And are you going to do it as a sort of a national interest or are you going to leave developers sort of decide what they want to do? So it's like hydrogen pipelines and wires, privatisation of them. You know, if you're a local authority person or you're in the NRA um, in Ireland, the National Roads Authority, well, the NTA now as it's called, you know... The last thing you need is some guy who wants to put a hydrogen pipeline down your motorway and he's, you know, he's not going to reinstate it properly. That has a net impact on the overall economy. So, you know, it's about better land use, transport, energy and economic planning for the country. And I don't understand why, if I look at Ireland, PLC or Limited, whatever you want to call it, and if I look at what happens is, you know, even between the ministers, they have different opinions. Even between the departments, they have different opinions. And... You know, the conversation with the Department of Finance and Revenue in relation to how we pass on 400 euros or 200 euros to the public and how to make impact for the people who know, most need it is lost in the discussion. Because it's a, it's a bit of PR and a clickbait for a politician for a few votes. So this is the problem. So we have a democracy and we all vote, but we're not voting. So this all then ties back into ESG. So to me, if you want to maximise your ESG policies, you have better governance in your whole system. Yeah, and that kind of echoes back to the... Um, and then you have better signals to the market. Yes, and that almost echoes back to, to um, Dr Lynch's top-down versus bottom-up tension, I think, um, and yeah. especially, if, especially if the bottom-up is guided by a confusing um, you know, multiple set of potential uh, ESG standards, which are murky uh, to, to some... Um, Peter, from a legal perspective, um, and you're all about the risks, I, uh, I hear. So uh, what have you got for us? I suppose, you know, the legal risks around ESG are, are still pretty much in their infancy because it, it's a relatively new concept. And in fact, sometimes the risks are more around the commercial damage to your reputation, damage to your, you know, relationship with your funders, your ability to get finance with your consumers or your customers. But from the legal perspective, I think you can break the risks down to sort of two main headings. You've first got the regulatory risk, and then you've separately got sort of private law claims. And when you look at, at regulatory risk, I suspect a lot of people in this room over the last 10 years, whatever industry you're in, your regulator has never been more vocal. You've, you're subject to way more regulation than you ever have been. And if you get something wrong, the likelihood of, being, of enforcement action is probably you know, more likely to happen now than ever before. And that trend of increased regulation is what you're now seeing over certainly the last year or so in ESG. And what you're seeing internationally, certainly at the moment, is a lot of regulators, you know, what I'm calling the hunt for greenwashing, is they're actively going out to the market and you know, sense checking what um, you know, funds are doing, what companies are saying in relation to their green credentials. 
So in the US, there's been a number of fines this year already in relation to this. I think quite interestingly from an Irish perspective is the CBI has set up their own internal unit in relation to this and say they're going to start focusing on greenwashing. Um, the, the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK in just July, they're gone, have launched an investigation into fast fashion brands, um, Boohoo and ASOS, where they're looking into um, effectively what they are saying to the market and to consumers in relation to their green credentials. And I think it's the outcome of those types of investigations that we're going to see over the next 18 months or so is going to have a significant impact on this uh, jurisdiction. And then I suppose when you turn to the, the private law claims, they break down into two. One is your follow-on claim. So Dieselgate is the prime example of a follow-on claim where you have consumers from a regulatory fine. Consumers then have a cause of action against a particular manufacturer. The other main types of claims is effectively shareholders, um, investors, you know, bringing claims against companies and their directors for basically the difference between what they said they would do and what they're actually doing in practice in relation to the, their ESG statements. And if I was to, to crystal ball gaze at all in relation to any of this from an Irish perspective, I think what we will see certainly in the main focus over the next two to three years will be the follow-on claims. There's new legislation coming in around consumer collective class actions, which is coming into law next year in Ireland, which is going to be a big change generally. And I think this is one of the areas where you're going to see a lot more from a company's perspective, a risk around that sort of issue. Mm. Certainly in terms of your comments about regulation, I mean, it's almost like a law of nature. Regulation expands to fill the available headspace. Um, it's only Donald Trump's Washington where regulations are ever uh, removed and then only temporarily. So, yeah, that's uh, it's some, some, uh, some, some good points there. Just uh, in the interest of trying to end on, on, a, on a positive note before we, uh, before we head to the, uh, the coffee break, um, Mirren, um, like, from your point of view, what's the... How can the benefits of ESG um, uh, best be unlocked? Yeah, so I would say um, getting more information and more transparency out can really help in terms of moving from that micro to a systems perspective. So um, one of the things that I've been doing a lot lately is talking about electricity markets in the media. Um, and I, I, you know, I've got you know, my dad's cousin's ringing me up and saying, is that really how it works? I didn't know, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and I think what this might do is it might broaden the opportunity for activities that can be um, perceived by stakeholders, whether that's shareholders, board members, whomever, as ESG. So instead of saying, you know, we installed something in order to make our particular plant more efficient, you can say something like, we entered into a smart communications contract with another company in order to provide more flexibility to the grid. Um, so this means that you're able to contribute to the system while also um, selling that, or not, not in a pejorative way, but actually contributing toward ESG. Um, I think as we also need to be realistic in our goals and our policies and, and be honest about what is and isn't achievable. And uh, anything anyone can do to, to increment toward those goals and policies is great. But if we're coming at this from the point of view of... Um, it needs to be 100% or else it doesn't count, then we're not going to get there because, again, we'll get locked into that micro-level side of things. Yeah, I'd like some of your comments in the media um, uh, from other events about the need to maybe be more public and be more open about what net zero might cost us because often, you know, the, the goal is described but not so much the costs and the potential impacts upon each of us. And I think um, you've been quite vociferous and, and rightly so in, um, in bringing out the importance of that, that, that issue, I suppose. Yeah, and I think one of the things we learned from COVID is how quickly we can react under severe pressure. Um, and I'm seeing that quick reaction again now um, regarding potential blackouts, regarding super high fossil fuel prices. We didn't get that speed, that urgency, when the only crisis we were dealing with was, was the climate crisis. Mm. Um, and the, the truth of the matter is, in order to meet our climate targets, we have to do an, a ridiculous amount of work and it's going to be incredibly costly. And unless we're upfront about that um, uh, and maybe stop selling it as some kind of a win-win-win, which, which just isn't the case, um, then we're, unfortunately, we're, we may make increments, but we're not going to hit the goals. Mm, very good. Yeah, there's been plenty of fodder for the behavioural scientists over the last few years. That's before. Yes. <laughs> um, Paul, moving to you, and we have to probably hurry along because we're uh, under a wee bit of time pressure, but uh, what's, what's, your, what's your, um, your thoughts on how e ESG could... Uh, best be unlocked in terms of benefits? Well, the, the, one, the one really good thing is there's lots of funding available. Uh, so normally, 
Uh, there, there would be times you would speak at a conference like this and you would have bankers actually throwing 50s up onto the stage uh, for, for the right projects. Can I go to those conferences? <laughs> um, but, so, so the funding is there to, to enable it to happen um, if, if all of those other pieces uh, can come together. Uh, I suppose quick wins that, that would really en enable uh, more progress to be made, uh, as, as Barry mentioned previously, we absolutely need private wire legislation enacted, and, and I mean within the next uh, three to six months. It's been sitting around. It needs to be uh, brought through. Well, I think we have legislation, uh, just we don't have an administrative kind of uh, system behind that. I mean, it's, it's there in the statute book and has been for years, but it's just not, not being... We, 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 need to, we need to enable it. Now, there are many, many large energy users out there who would like to have direct renewable energy supply, and we can't deliver it for them. So, so that's one piece that the government can really take action on and, and ensure it happens. Uh, the, the next piece, um, going back to security of supply, uh, we, we need to change the ECP rule set for battery storage connection applications. Uh, we have 300 megawatts of battery storage on one site. We can't get a connection offer because it doesn't meet the criteria that is set down in the ECP rule set. But that's just ludicrous. I mean, uh, Mark Foley presented uh, er earlier to say that there's a shortfall of 280 megawatts in this uh, peak time. Well, battery storage can contribute. I'm not saying it's the sole solution, but battery storage can contribute to that security of supply issue that we have at peak times. But unless we can get uh, major projects uh, through the connection process quickly, then we, we can't offer so up. So you'd like more victories from the, top, the bottom up over the top down uh, in those kind of areas? Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Um, uh, Aoife, um, anything you could, uh, you could recommend? I suppose, um, first thing anyway, is an, an alignment in the reporting. So that needs to be done. The second thing, the EU taxonomy, you know, and the metrics that are out there for reporting, that needs to be aligned as well. There needs to be a, a single clear materiality process, standards process, sustainability process, because then you'll avoid your greenwashing and you'll only... It will also be avoided then in other sectors like housing, transport, clothing, manufacturing and pharma. So if you're doing, you have a cobalt mine or a lithium ion mine or you're making runners out in Taiwan or wherever, um, Vietnam, you know, there is a moral obligation there and there's a carbon footprint associated with that and, and its shipment. Um, then in terms of, you know, what companies can do, I really think it's about time now that there was an ESG expert in every board, preferably an engineer, okay, because if I look at boards and I see who's on them, and I've been buying stocks since I was 18 or 19 years of age, it's a bit of a hobby of mine. Um, what I find ironic is you have an accountant, you have a financier, you have sales guys. Only really in engineering companies will you have engineers. So I think that's an issue um, in other sectors. Um, so I think there should be an ES ESG expert on boards. It should be mandatory. Um, and I suppose if I look at, you know, if we go back to the, the TCFD guidelines, they're very, very important. And I think we need something like that in, in, in Ireland if we're meant to be a green economy. Um, now, I know the central bank is, is forming a group at the moment, but like, I mean, that again is going to be voluntary. So um, I'd have an issue about that. I suppose, look, if you put it in terms and if you go back to Mark Carney, did a really, the former head of the Bank of England, he did a really interesting interview in The Economist there years ago. And he said the energy crisis, and it's the energy crisis is now. Um, and I suppose, like, I've been modelling, you know, and analysing this for years. And I'm running some numbers at the moment. And this is the problem. In the olden days, in the 50s and 60s, when we did large capital infrastructure projects as engineers for government, and capital was leveraged over long-term bond, we did a cost-benefit analysis. Cost-benefit analysis has seemed to have gone out the window. And in that, you would then societize and do the econometrics to run the costs and find out how much would it cost each citizen in the state. And how would we get that money back in, 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 a, in a revenue or a tax or a charge? That's missing in this targets because we've become so hung up on emissions. It's all about emissions to the detriment of good engineering. Mm. So we had 30 years of wave energy, which didn't deliver. Now we have the hydrogen highway. And this isn't the second. This is the third reincarnation of the hydrogen highway. The cheapest way to make hydrogen is from fossil fuels. There's no two ways about it. Carbon capture, storage and utilisation is going to be the last mile. 
It's going to be for large emitters of carbon. It's not going to be for small countries. Ireland is a small country. Us talking about it, really, we're not going to emit that volume of carbon with the current technology that's out there. So there are the issues. Storage is important to Ireland. So if we look at the problem at the moment, why was Kinsale decommissioned without any backup for gas storage on the island of Ireland? It's farcical. With some dream of having an LNG with cheap gas coming from the US. You know? So that's, you know, the market goes up. Of course the Yanks are going to sell the gas at the same price as Europe. They're in it to make money. They're investors. They're not there for the fun of it. So this is all about ESG, and there are the issues that we have. There's a bit of a sort of a short-term vision there. It really needs to be more long-term. Mm. Okay, so, so there are the benefits if you do of, the yeah, right thing. A lot of issues there with the, with the policy balance as it currently um, um, obtains. Uh, Peter, anything from a legal perspective? I think just quick final comments from me. I suppose conscious that you know, we've talked about these are the risks. What can you do now? I think there's two things you can do now which are fairly basic at any organisational level is understand your regulatory framework and be up to date. You know, the days of when your regulator would sort of, you know, was in mode of educating the industry around things are long gone. You've no excuse not to be up to date with your regulation requirements. And then the second thing, as I mentioned earlier, most of the cases around um, these types of issues, or a lot of the cases around, are the, the delta or the difference between co what companies are saying they're doing to the market and what they're actually doing in practice. And to view your sort of public announcements and statements with that lens to identify that delta, because ultimately that's what claimants' lawyers do ultimately down the road if there's ever to be litigation. Mm, good. No, thanks very much. Um, just a couple of uh, comments from the floor um, or, or queries. Um, so the point by Merrin regarding one policy per objective is, is very interesting. How to reconcile a need for solar panels and forced labour in China. So I guess we're talking here about international policies, aren't we? It's a, uh, you know, it's... Um, we had to reconcile that certainly within our own uh, sovereign jurisdiction. Um, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, in, in some ways I'd say that's, that's a good example of needing one policy per objective. I mean, we, we're talking about two objectives there. One is we want um, renewable electricity, and the other is we don't want forced labour. So you, you need... Um, now, if, if a policy that encourages renewable electricity results in an increase in demand for forced labour then I would say you probably need to strengthen your policies against forced labour rather than weaken your policies in favour of renewable electricity. Um, does the panel feel that the new EU taxonomy for sustainable ESG-based investing will make a real difference, given the inclusion of gas and nuclear as green? Um, Aoife, maybe you have a view on that. Um, could you repeat the question? Do you think the EU taxonomy will actually be effective, um, given that it's, it's including natural gas and nuclear as green within the, the ESG reporting but framework? To, to be honest, you know, we're locked into carbon and we have to be pragmatic and realistic. And what's happened is subsidy schemes for renewables have been variable in different countries and the numbers don't stack up. And what's happened is you've inframarginal units making a profit and all the renewable companies are sitting there and they're quite happy. And then gas takes a hit and people are playing with gas and they make a profit. And then what happens is companies are quietly shutting down production across Europe and we'll have see increased employment, unemployment. So then what does that mean for the economy? It means that people have less disposable income to buy the stuff that we make and then that will have a global impact. So people in China are worried about it as well. So um, I really don't care what way you label any energy product. To me, energy is energy. I'm an engineer, okay? It makes no difference. Yeah? Whether it's green, brown, purple or blue. It can be the rainbow. I don't care. Okay? Because I want the best energy with the least emissions at the least cost to make the most money for people so they can spend the most money in the economy. And we can run our schools and our hospitals. And that's not what's going on at the moment. Because we have artificially, artificially stacked the cards for one sector. And that has led into the cannibalisation of the wholesale market price and then what you have is in the UK, in the case of the Elexon, you have under-the-counter trades, you have private um, PPPs, power purchase agreements, private power purchase agreements. So you have a whole plethora of instruments like ancillary services that are not included in the wholesale market prices. 
all of these things actually lead to a lack of transparency that you can't understand. So as, as if you're an, anal an analyst working in Goldman Sachs or one of these organizations around the world, you know, you can't do the numbers to say, actually, this is a worthwhile investment. You know, the other question then is, what have the auctionaries been doing for the last 50 years? So, like, I mean, they're the guys who should be working out the risk. So if you look at France, France is going to have a problem. We're, we're going to have a fertilizer issue. So this all leads into gas markets and the right or the wrongs of anything. You know, it, it really should be energy security, economic security, and environmental security. It should be the three E's of those security issues for the EU. Like, I mean, ad hoc decisions by, um, you know, Ursula von der Leyen, like, I mean, all she's doing is kicking the can down the road and she's creating a massive pension issue. Mm. Yeah, well, we're all waiting with uh, bated breath to see what comes out of tomorrow. But uh, there we go. So those are our, our views on, uh, on um, ESG. And it's now um, as the, uh, the coffee break looms. I just want to finish with the other piece of data we got out of the, the pre-conference survey about ESG. And we asked the audience um, on ESG policy, which of the following statements do you agree with the most? And this is a bit of good news to end on in, in view of the, uh, the topic of the conference. It should be possible to achieve energy security while also pursuing the environmental aims of ESG policy was the most popular uh, position. So the audience at least, the market at least, thinks that the two can coexist, energy security and ESG, and let's hope that's the case. So uh, thank you very much to the panelists and thank you for listening. <laughs>
this is what my children's headmistress does, and it's much more effective when she does it than obviously it's working for me. She just stands there and pivots through 180 degrees until she gets silence in the room. Oh, it does work. That's good. Um, Envy is a very unproductive human emotion, but I am genuinely very envious of uh, our next speaker who's going to deliver this morning's keynote address because she's done it all uh, in both the journalistic world as an author and now as somebody who, I don't think she likes the term, but I'm still going to go with it, is a carbon strategist uh, and thinker. Uh, Gabriel Walker is not somebody who's going to need a big, long, wordy introduction from me. She's going to deliver uh, a presentation for 20 minutes. I'm going to talk to her for a few minutes, and then I want to get a dialogue going with you guys in the room uh, and with Gabriel, because she's somebody I spent two hours talking to last night, and it passed in the blink of an eye, and you're all going to want to get in on this conversation. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium Gabriel Walker, the founder of Valence Solutions and the founder of Rethinking Removals. Thank you. It was quite the conversation, and it was good crack, so thanks very much for that, and to MHD. Oh, she's so. Irish. <laughs> she uses crack properly. <laughs> I am actually a dual citizen, British and Irish, so it's very good to be home. Thanks for inviting me. So I'm actually here to talk about something that you all know a lot about already. So how can I possibly do that? Tell you something that's going to uh, show you uh, sustainability and climate change in a slightly different light. I'm going to give it a crack. And uh, I'm starting with this picture. It's a quite weird way to start a, a, a conversation, a, a lecture about climate change. Um, that is actually me. Um, and I'm out in the, the wee small hours of the morning, as I sometimes do, looking at beautiful things in the sky. Uh, go on then, what am I looking at? What's that white dot in the top that I'm looking at? Any guesses? Anyone? Is, is it a planet? Oh my God, that's the fastest anyone's got it. It is the planet Venus. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. That was really quick. It is the planet Venus. Why am I starting this talk about uh, climate change with a picture of me looking at the planet Venus? I'll show you. Now, this is um, the, the Earth, my favourite planet. It's very lovely. It's got water. It's got green things. It's got life. It's a very comfortable temperature on the surface, around, around the sort of 20, 25 degrees mark. Um, this is Venus. And uh, it's actually to scale. Venus is, is it almost exactly the same size as Earth. It really is our sister planet. And it's actually it's, it's pretty similar distance from the sun. It's a little bit closer to the sun. So you'd expect it to be a little bit warmer and the Earth to be a little bit colder. But in fact, it's not just a little bit warmer. Venus, the surface of Venus is hot enough to melt lead. It's 450 degrees C. And you can ask yourself, it's actually a hellhole. You can ask yourself, why is there such a big difference between these two planets when otherwise they are so similar? And there is one difference, ladies and gentlemen. It is that greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Venus has very substantial amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this is what happens to a planet when you do that. I just want us to remember that, because I'm going to talk now about climate change. And we've all been talking and hearing this morning about, about renewable energy infrastructure and why we're doing it and how we need to be more urgent and stuff. I'm going to put some, some flesh on those bones for you. So, it used to be, of course, that ESG, climate, all of this stuff was really for tree huggers. It has mainstreamed. It has started to become something. It really seems like it's there for business. And this is why. This is Sarah Breeden from the Bank of England. And she said this earlier this year. She said, climate risks are uncertain but predictable. And listen to this. They will affect every consumer and every corporate in all sectors and in all geographies. That is why we're talking about climate change. It's a massive financial risk. It's a massive risk to business. It's a massive risk to financial stability. It's material. And uh, when um, Mark Carney was still governor of the Bank of England and chairman of the Financial Stability Board, this is how he characterised it. Climate change presents significant risks for global financial stability for two reasons. Direct physical risks and risks from transition costs. I'm going to take those two in a row. You'll see things that you already know, but just bear in mind... Direct physical risks and risks from transition costs are direct material risks to doing business in a climate change era. Okay, first of all, direct physical risks. Now, this is going to get a bit ugly, so you have to brace yourself. 
What I'm talking about is direct physical risk to assets, to infrastructure, to things that are essential in your supply chain, to things that can actually get burnt down or flooded or can stop production and therefore have a material risk to your ability to do business. So I'm starting with temperature. This is starting in 1880. It's obviously a map of the world. And it's going to show you how temperatures have changed since the 1880. This is actually showing you how variable our temperatures really are. If it gets a bit bluer, it's going a bit colder somewhere in the world. If it gets a bit yellow or redder, it's going a bit warmer. Let's see what happens. So that was actually quite a cool period. It's, it, was, it was really quite cold for large parts of it in the early 1900s. Um, then a bit of a flicker of, of warmth in the, in the north in the 20s and 30s then. And then it kind of goes a bit colder again. See how variable it is. It's amazing. It goes colder, warmer, colder, warmer. All the way through, we're in the 60s and then the 70s. And then we get to the 80s. And then we get to the 90s. And then the 2000s. And the 2010s. It's not subtle. It's not subtle, and it's not something in the future, and it's not something for our grandchildren, and it's not something that we worry about if we want to be nice to the planet. It is here, and it is now. And I want you to take that away with you today. So, I'm not going to show you that again, but I am going to show you this. So, earlier this year, we had that incredible heat wave across India and Pakistan. India was even worse hit. So, 40, 50 degrees C in India, unprecedented heat waves in India. Um, this is uh, the Yangtze River. Oh, you know, it doesn't look much like the Yangtze River, does it? Almost nobody seems to be talking about this, and I don't quite understand why, because China has just experienced a heat wave even worse than the one that went across India and, and uh, Pakistan. Right? And, and, and it, was, it was spectacular because it was the broadest geographically that China has ever experienced. It was the highest in terms of temperature increase that China's ever experienced. And it was the longest in time that China has ever experienced. And one of the consequences was that the rivers started drying up. The rivers started drying up, which meant that the hydroelectric plants were actually switched off, which meant that the power was switched off, which meant that manufacturing couldn't happen, which meant that it was exacerbating the supply chain, uh, exacerbating the supply chain crisis we already have, China being the manufacturing center of the world. And then on top of that, because of the heat wave in China, there was also a reduction in food production in China, which is exacerbating the food crisis that we're already experiencing. And that's right now. Then there's the fires. You know, when I used to do this, uh, I've been actually talking about climate change, God help me, for 20 years or so, and I used to find it hard to find pictures to illustrate what I said was going to be coming. Now it's actually hard to choose. Which, which fires, which forest fires... Not just forest fires, which fires are sweeping the world? The places in California that are getting letters through their letterbox saying, your home, your business is no longer insurable against fire. Or Australia, or Sweden, or Russia. This is actually Canada, where one particular village, after three days of plus 45 degrees C temperatures, spontaneously burst into flame. I told you it got, got bleak. Uh, it's going to get better. Stay with me. It is going to get better. But we've also got food shortages now because of the droughts, like the one that I mentioned in China. And that has other consequences, geopolitical consequences, consequences for business beyond just food, because you also get migration. And think about the impact, the geopolitical impact that the migration has already had on Europe. And the people migrating into Europe from North Africa and from Syria, there's lots of reasons why there's those wars taking place in those particular arenas, lots of very complicated historical reasons. But I just make the comment that both of them started with a prolonged drought. And I spoke to a military general who said, you know, the kind of migration that we're seeing at the moment is a walk in the park compared to what we'll get if we really let climate change take hold. And here's an example of that. Because right now, did you know that right now Pakistan is experiencing very dramatic floods? So, you know, you can kind of hear this. I, I, I got sent messages about it. Yeah, I know there's floods everywhere, blah, blah, blah. And then I had another look at it and went, wait, what? 33%, a third of the country. Pakistan is not a small country. A third of the country is underwater. Right now, 40 million people have been displaced. Right now. This is climate change that's here, and it's real, and it's with us, and it's having a dramatic impact already. And we haven't, by the way, even got to 1.5 degrees. So here's a mega hurricane. You know, the hurricanes are beginning getting stronger, blah, 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 lots of, lots of big, bad hurricanes around the Caribbean and stuff. 
Um, I was talking about this in 2019 in, in uh, Toronto to a bunch of retail investors. And I said to them, you know, blah, 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 this particular hurricane. And one guy came to me afterwards and said, you shouldn't have chosen that hurricane. You should choose this one, Hurricane Dorian. And I said, why? Why pick that one? And he said, I used to have a house in the Bahamas. He said, I don't anymore. He said, I used to be a climate denier. Those are his words. He said, I'm not anymore. He said, it looked like a nuclear bomb had hit it. And actually, that's a good analogy because the amount of heat energy we're putting in the atmosphere at the moment is the equivalent of four Hiroshima bombs worth of energy every second. That's what we're doing with the, with the fossil fuels that we're burning. So you can say that bad storms happen all the time, heat waves happen all the time. How do you know that this is actually something that's different and real? So look at this, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines 2013, the strongest tropical storm ever recorded in the Eastern Hemisphere. Hurricane Patricia, Mexico 2015, strongest tropical storm ever recorded in the Western Cyclone. Winston, Fiji 2016, strongest tropical storm ever recorded in the Southern Hemisphere. We are seeing patterns now that we cannot ignore. Okay, so... <laughs> Bit of light relief here. Who the heck's that? It is Lance Armstrong, obviously. Why on earth do I have a picture of Lance Armstrong in the middle of all this? Apart from just to get away for a moment from all this terrifying stuff, he's holding up seven fingers for the seven times he won the Tour de France. And you can ask yourself, you know, which of those times that he won was because he was on drugs, he was on steroids, he was cheating? Which of those seven times? Was it the first one? Was it the third one or fourth one? More sensibly, you could say... By taking steroids, he was making all of those wins more likely. And ladies and gentlemen, with the fossil fuels that we've been burning, with the, the, the uh, agriculture we've been doing, with the ways that we've been doing business, with the ways that we've been making energy, we have been putting our atmosphere on steroids. And we are now making all of those so-called natural disasters very much more likely. So that's why, yet again, there was yet another set of headlines and yet another IPCC report. Hey, it's science, you know, it's a code red for humanity. And it's actually quite easy to look at that and go, yeah, yeah, I kind of know that. We're just trying to do our job. And what I wanted to say in all of this, when we're talking material financial risk, we're talking material risk to assets, it's not anymore a kind of, yeah, I know, we know. It's really got serious, it's got real, and it's got now. So that was the risk from physical risk, direct physical risk, risk from transition costs, because we are not the only people who've noticed that. And already this transition is underway, as you all know. So what are the risks from transition costs? I'm going to pick on something. It's a bit unfair. Pick on coal. It's easy to pick on coal. What's going to strand? I used to be talking about how some assets are going to strand. Be careful how you're investing. Look at the way the world's going. You know, in 2020, Peabody wrote off $1.5 billion from the world's largest coal mine in the USA. Coal is coming back in different ways, and I'm, I, I'm happy to talk about that when, when we talk later. But I just wanted to mention these things. Last year, G7 and China both separately agreed to stop all new fin financing for overseas unabated coal. If it's not abated, it doesn't get money from the G7 or from China. And then in 2020, oil and gas companies reported all those downgrades. The, the energy system is complicated. We know what's happening now, but I'm just saying already... It's not saying things are going to strand, it's that things are already stranding. And it's not just assets that will strand, it's business models that will strand. It's how our regulation is changing, it's how our consumer appreciation is changing, it's how our international agreement is changing. And it's also, you know, how are, how are investors changing in their appetite for where the risks might go? So, uh, Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock. Uh, he actually said in January 2020, climate change has become a defining factor in companies' long-term prospects. I believe we're on the edge of a fundamental reshaping of finance. A fundamental reshaping of finance. Not a kind of, let's tinker around the edges, but a fundamental reshaping of finance. And that's over the next 10 years. I'm going to romp through that in a moment. But first of all, I just wanted to say something quick about the crises we've been encountering. This is where the news, in a way, starts to get a bit better, even though I'm talking about crises. Because I asked myself the question, is this energy transition robust? We know we need to do it. We know what needs to be done. But is it actually robust? Because we're being hit by all these crises. Is it being shoved onto the back burner? And Larry Fink asked the same question. He said, in January 2021, in his letter, he said, in March, the conventional wisdom was a crisis would divert attention from climate. But just the opposite took place. And the reallocation of capital accelerated even faster than I anticipated. The pandemic has reminded us how the biggest crises, medical or environmental, 
demand a global and ambitious response, January 2021. We heard this in the previous panel as well. And I've been asking lots of the businesses I work with, I work at, at C-suite level with lots of global businesses, and they have not let up on their climate action. And I've said, why? Why didn't, why didn't the pandemic give you the excuse to let up? And they said two things. First of all, we know this transition is underway. We know we need to get ready for the 21st century properly. We had resets in our plan over the next five to eight years. And now we have an opportunity to do it. We'll do it sooner than we can get with the programme. And the other thing they said, investors have not let up their pressure. They have increased it. The pressure from investors who are worried about the financial risk to their investment is now uh, inexorable. And then, of course, along comes the Ukraine war. I don't have time to talk about it in detail. You all know probably more about this than I do, but I just want to make one observation about it. Of course, it's triggered this massive energy security crisis. And what I've been hearing as well, you know, there's, there's the, the rising gas prices, there's the, the issue with, uh, you know, rising uh, electricity prices, there's the, the, the shift in oil, there's the, the, the race to LNG, there's the race to coal, there's never mind about climate, we just need to get energy, right? That's, that's the story of the Ukraine crisis. But not entirely, because I've also been hearing this phrase, not just energy security, as we have in the title of this conference, energy sovereignty, the need for energy sovereignty, I think within the European Union, there is a kind of, we share energy, but we have a border and we need to worry about where our energy comes from and, and uh, how uh, we, we, uh, we get our vital resource from friends rather than from enemies or from potential enemies. So this thing about energy sovereignty means make your energy where you are and not importing it from countries whose values you don't share and who might make you vulnerable, which of course drives towards renewable energy. So there is a kind of short, medium-term look at things like LNG, but there's a very strong push now from an energy sovereignty, energy security point of view with renewables, which is good news. Then there's the supply chain crisis. All of this, you know, the, the, the Pentagon has long said that uh, climate change is a threat multiplier, and of course it makes the supply chain crisis worse. But also this focus on the resilience of the supply chain is also uh, giving, a, I think, a whole different view of how we work with our suppliers. And that's been a necessary and vital part of the whole climate story. It's not enough to say we're dealing with our own emissions, even our own country's emissions. It's where does the stuff come from? And I'm going to say a bit more about that in a moment. So a very quick observation about the, the COPs. I'm happy to talk about it later if you want to. I was there in Glasgow, the next one coming up in, in uh, Sharm El Sheikh. But just the role that businesses have played in pushing for action from governments is extraordinary. That's the thing that was striking in COP in Glasgow. The governments are still messing around, they still can't, handle, can't get the agreement. And, and, and business after business, sector after sector, finance sector particularly leading, we're saying, we're doing this already. We know it has to happen, we're doing it already. And that, that's really inspiring, and that's a message for all of us in this room. Because there is a who's going to fix this, and the answer is, we are. So, quick comment on net zero. Net zero has gone rampant. Another piece of good news. And so now, you know, a, a, a few years ago, if you said something about net zero by 2050, people looked at you, looked at me like I was a crazed hippie. And now, if you don't have a net zero by 2050 target, you're not at the table. And if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So the, the rise of net zero, and in fact, now it's more than 80% of global GDP generators either have their own net zero by 2050 target or are in a territory that has a net zero target of its own. And it's not just about 2050, of course, it's about today. So look at this. The USA's NDC, it's a commitment to 50% or more reduction from 20, uh, 2005 by 2030. Ireland, this is legally enshrined. The USA one, of course, is not. Ireland legally enshrined 51% by 2030. EU emissions reduction also legally enshrined by 55% by 2030. UK emissions also legally enshrined uh, by 78% by 2035. These are very big numbers. This is very hard. So it's also looking pretty inevitable. This is the hedge funds are on this. Look at him, Pierre Anderon. We're comfortable, he says, over a five-year horizon that the EU carbon price has to go up. That's pretty much a guarantee. The hedges are saying this is a one-way bet now. And that's yet more evidence. This transition is real. It's happening. It cannot be stopped. And then look at this. This is the, 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 when Mark Carney was still governor of the Bank of England. The, the joint governments of the bank, governors of the Bank of England and the Bank of France sent out this letter. They said this thing about carbon emissions have to dis, dis, decline this much. In, a, in what I think is a big understatement, this requires a massive reallocation of capital. But then look at this. If some companies and industries fail to adjust to this new world, they fail to exist. This is now very real in the business world. 
So I want to show just a couple of things that we might pick up on in the, in the conversations. One is thinking about embedded emissions. If you're in the construction industry, thinking about embedded emissions, it's now becoming clear that it's not just about what happens to the thing you build, it's, it's the, the emissions that, that were used to create it in the first place. 8% of global emissions come from steel. Uh, also concrete. This is a house in a set of houses in, uh, in Norway where they're designed not just to be net positive in terms of the use, but also of the emissions that they contain in their concrete. Also this, this is very interesting, a getting to zero coalition, a new uh, approach to getting, net, uh, getting zero emission ships on the high seas at scale by 2030. This is a coalition aiming to do this, and I think they're going to do it in eight years. And the way they're doing it is they're working right across the value chain. They've got the banks, they've got the ship owners, manufacturers, they've got the, uh, the, the owners of the cargo, they've got the uh, providers of the fuel, everyone working together to figure out how to do it, a new kind of collaboration. Also, of course, hydrogen. We might talk a bit more about that later, but this has gone from being something that might be good for passenger vehicles at some point to something that really could be right across the energy transition. Very big, exciting area. But the final thing, and just the last minute or two that I'm going to speak to you, is something I've been working on a lot, and it is carbon removals. John Kerry said in April 2021, even if we get to net zero, we still need to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and that's a bigger challenge than a lot of people have grabbed onto. It is. Microsoft are already on this, as well as saying they're going to be carbon negative by 2030, they said they're going to remove their historical emissions by 2050, and they also have this $1 billion climate fund. So how do you do it? How do you take CO2 back out of the air and keep it out? You can do it with trees. Trees are great carbon capture machines, and in fact I did a TED talk on this if you want to run and watch it, but the uh, problem with trees is they burn and the CO2 goes back into the sky. It's not a long-term solution for capture of carbon. You can, catch, you can get the wood and you can put it into buildings. It's great. It, replaces, uh, it displaces uh, cement, which is a big polluter. It uh, locks the carbon up in the building, and also they are beautiful. You can also take it directly from the air. These are two... <coughs> skipped over there. This is a big plant that's being built in Texas that's going to remove a million tonnes of CO2 a year and put it... I love the poetry of this. It's like reversing the valve. It's going to put it back where the Texas oil came from. A million tons a year, and it's the first large-scale commercial plant of what I think are going to be many. And this is a plant in Iceland doing the same thing. I'm going to finish off with this, because this plant in Iceland I thought was really amazing. I actually went to visit it a couple of weeks ago. And it's doing two things. First of all, there's, there's a hydrothermal power station. So the hydrothermal power station, which is getting hydrothermal power, providing all the electricity and all the heating for downtown Reykjavik. So that's the reduction part. We need to get emissions down as fast as we possibly can. Then on top of that, on the back of it, they're taking CO2 out of the sky using the energy from the power station. And then they're using the, the wells that the power station uses to put the water back into the basalt to inject the CO2 back down again. So this is we need to reduce as fast as we can and we need to remove CO2 from the air happening in one glorious place. It's just a start. But I think this is a really exciting area and also it's going to be very big. But at the moment, we're removing maybe 100,000 tonnes from the atmosphere every year. And now, by 2030, we need to increase that by a factor of roughly 10,000. So this is going to explode in everybody's faces very soon. Watch out for it. But the other thing I finally wanted to mention about Iceland is this glacier. I went to visit it. Well, at least I went to visit where it used to be, because this is what it looked like in 1986. And this is what it looked like in 2019. It was gone. This is the Ock Glacier in Iceland, and it has gone. And the Icelandic people being what they are, they actually they made a plaque, a funeral for the glacier. I climbed up with the person who wrote the words in this plaque, the, very, the plaque, the very brilliant Andre Magnusson. I climbed up over the rubble that it had left behind to see the plaque that they have left from this disappeared glacier. I'm going to finish with the words of that plaque for you. It's a letter to the future. It says, Ock. Is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. In the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it. August 2019. 415 parts per million of CO2. We do know what's happening. And we do know what needs to be done. We are the people who can make it happen. 
and God help us if we don't. Thanks very much. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, equal parts terrifying and inspiring, as I promised. Um, can I pick up on a conversation that we had last night uh, where you, you did something very unfair. You asked me what's Ireland's superpower, uh, which <laughs> suggests to me that you might hold an Irish passport, but you haven't really tapped into the national psychosis yet of <laughs> running the place down, which is just something that you have to do. So it forced me into a conversation with you where we thought about what we can possibly do. And naturally, you being the queen of carbon removal, that is where our conversation ended up. It is. And what is the enormous business opportunity, environmental opportunity, mm. climate opportunity, just waiting off our western shore? Yeah, I, I think, so I, I skipped over it quickly at the end, but let me just, let me just sort of emphasise that the messages, and, and the IPCC really emphasised this earlier this year in their final report, where they said carbon removals are now unavoidable, and started to calculate how much we're going to need. So what we need to do is we need to get emissions down to net zero by 2050. So that means going absolutely as fast as we can with everything that's possible in the, in the toolbox and more. And then in addition to that, between now and 2050, we need to remove cumulatively, in order to have a fighting chance of keeping below 1.5, we need to remove cumulatively, brace yourself for this number, 200 billion tonnes of CO2 from the atmosphere. So we're currently removing 100,000 tonnes a year, and we need to remove 200 billion to match all of those net zero commitments that everybody's cheerfully making. And that's pretty expensive. It's expensive to do air capture at the moment is of the order of three or $400 a tonne. There are plenty of people who are saying the real price on carbon is going to be not, not what the ETS says it is with the, with the changing energy at market, but how much it costs to take it back out again. How much are we removing at the moment? 100,000 tonnes a year. And it's 200... 200 b b billion, billion so that we need cumulatively. It, in so that, business terms, this is a growth market. It's a big growth market. It's trillions. It's trillions and trillions of dollars that are going to have to go into this. Now, what can Ireland do? Yeah. So it, has to, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to, to capture the CO2 from the atmosphere. And uh, that energy has to be renewable. And then the CO2 has got to go somewhere. So what you need is you need lots of renewable energy and you need an available store somewhere. And then you've got a market opportunity, right? Now, as, as far as available stores are concerned, there's now developments in the North Sea that perhaps could be in the Irish Sea, certainly around Iceland as well, of, of making stores that you can take CO2 to with ships. So, but the question is, who's got lots of renewable energy, which is, which is potential, but doesn't have an offtaker, doesn't have the, the, the um, industrial emissions to be able to, the, the industrial requirements to be able to to take the renewable energy. So it's just sitting there, it's the wind's blowing, the waves are moving, but it's not being used. Who's got that? Because at the moment, I think it's not exactly a controversial statement to say that we've dropped the ball on wind energy. It's maybe slightly more controversial to say that we're a long way behind the ball on hydrogen uh, mm. development. This is something that you're saying is a potential for Ireland to, if we got the game together, quick enough, become a world leader? I think it's really exciting because it's, it's, it's really, it, the, the, the numbers are inevitable. The technologies are out there. The ecosystem is incredibly dynamic, but it's all very early stage. This is a time where if you can grab a piece of this and show that you know how to do it, then you're going to be in a much better place than anyone else. And we take a very long time to build things <laughs> in this country, particularly energy infrastructure. You've heard that being recited all morning long. Uh, what would you say to us that we need to do on that front? Yeah, it is really interesting. I talked a bit about this last night with, and, and, and uh, Aoife this morning in, in the panel, she, she said a brilliant thing. She said, you know, it's a wild west out there, the developers, and there's also, you know, is this something that should be left to developers? Is this something that's a, that's a national benefit, a national good? What, what, what should be the relationship? If you just say, never mind the, the process, just let them do it. People, we're not in Russia. People have a right to have their say, so it's inevitable that it's going to get snarled. Of course, it's going to take 10, 12, 15, 20, 30 years, because that's how long it takes. And I say, I completely understand all of that, but I'd also refer to the vaccines. So, you know, in, in September 2019, <coughs> three years ago, if you'd asked me or anyone else, probably anyone in this room, anyone in the world, how long does it take to make a vaccine? 
If you got a new virus, you'd have said 10, 15 years minimum, if you could even make it. And then we had the crisis, and then we got it in a year. So it shows that the, 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 it, you know, we decide what needs to change to make it faster. We can. In that case, there were advanced purchase agreements. There were still all of the, all of the, 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 the rules about around how to actually test the vaccines and make sure that they're safe. But nonetheless, when we know that there's an urgency, we know how to speed up. And what I'm trying to tell you is, it's now urgent. 20 years ago, it wasn't. And it's now absolutely urgent. And any country that's saying, yeah, you know, it kind of takes us a long time, is going to be out of the game. To borrow a credo from a now very unpopular company, are you saying move fast and break things? <laughs> fail fast. Definitely fail fast. And be flexible and be ready to, to learn from it and move on. OK, practical application of that principle, though, would you say right now, if we knew that it was going to take us 10 to 12 years to get an LNG terminal through the planning process and actually commissioned, that we should bother or we should just say, no, that will be a stranded asset a decade from now? We need energy now, don't we? Yeah. I mean, and, and I think in the, the point is that that whole energy sovereignty point is where do you get your LNG from? Are you going to get it from Qatar? Rather than Russia, or, or, or depend on the US, and, 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 and who knows who might be elected there, who might suddenly decide that the gas needs to be America first. So if you really want energy sovereignty, and LNG isn't a long-term solution, but it is a short to medium one. So if you can do it fast enough, absolutely. But if you can't do it fast enough, I'm not seeing a, an argument for that. Can you explain sovereignty, or energy sovereignty, as an idea to me, though, please? Because I think, again, it might be a part of the Irish psychosis or condition <laughs> that when we hear... Uh, and this is an idea that I have heard coming from Britain. When we hear people from Britain <clears throat> talking about sovereignty of any kind, we know, oh, God, we're going to get it in the neck before long, aren't we? Uh, what, what, what does it mean? <laughs> does, it, does it necessarily exclude energy solidarity? No, I know, I, know, I really... That, that was a very sore point that you just touched on there, so I'm, I'm going to move swiftly on from, from some of the idiocies that are coming out of my beloved country. Um, but um, but I, I would like to apologise in advance for all of them. <laughs> what, for the next 10 years? For the next, uh, that's, that's a big apology. For the, for the next two years, at least. For the next two years, at least. I, I, who knows? Um, but anyway, um, in terms of sovereignty, I, I just think it's interesting that I heard that, because also after the Ukraine war hit, you, we all saw this. The solidarity in Europe, across Europe, and I mean the whole of Europe, I don't just mean the European Union, um, the solidarity was extraordinary. So I think energy solidarity goes along with energy sovereignty. There's a sense that, I just started to hear that phrase, and there's a sense that uh, we need to be making our energy in a place that we trust, or, or getting our energy from a place that we know we have a strong relationship with and we trust. And Germany made that mistake with Russia, thinking that, well, if Russia has an economic interest, then they're not going to break it, and they did. But it's not, so it's not just an economic interest, it's where do we have real trust, real relationship, real solidarity. So not Qatar, not Saudi, not Russia, and maybe not the United States? Who knows? I mean, you know, at the moment, I think that Qatar is, a, is clearly has got a lot of natural gas, and I think that, I think that they, they, they seem to be good partners. And, um, and the US is... marginally less odious than the Saudis? I'm not going to comment on odiousness, but I am going to say that it's just, if, if it's a country where you don't share the values and where you might be vulnerable then is it a good idea to put all your eggs into that basket? And the answer is, we've learned is absolutely not. Uh, one of the most profound things that I've heard said here this morning, uh, and it was tellingly said twice, uh, but on both occasions by women, and sorry, if there are any fellows who said it, I might have missed it, I apologise, but I thought it was notable that it came from women. And that was basically, uh, summed up in four words, let's do it together. Oh. I, I wonder, have you any panacea to what seems to be the problem that <laughs> besets this area, this territory at the moment. My solution versus ah, your solution. It's so exhausting. We're in such a hurry and it's so exhausting that I find it in every aspect that I'm working with. In fact, it's probably the thing that I spend most of my time doing and trying to unpick because it really is even, you know, like it's, it's, it's my solution, not your solution within all the, the efforts to decarbonize. So it should be solar, it should not, not wind. It should be this, not that. It should be, it should be electrification, not hydrogen. It should be. And then, and then in the whole, in the removal space, which is so tiny, it's still my removal and not yours. And then between them, it should be reduction, not removal. And, and, and really, while... People's popular front of Judea. Yeah, exactly. And while everyone's fighting amongst themselves about who's got the best answer, then the, the world carries on burning. And so it just, it really, it has to be everything on the table and everyone around the table. 
And I'm not interested in any more saints and sinners narrative. I'll work with anyone who I think can fix this. And, and really, you know, it's, 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 I think purism is really dangerous but, in this as well. But, but how do you address that problem then? Do we have to agree a narrative on what the energy landscape might look like by 2030 or by 2050 in order to remove that competition for ego and resources, it would seem? I do a lot of workshops on this exact topic. And the two things that I've learned that really, really help are, first of all, getting everyone to say what their aim is, what they're trying to make happen. What, what, the, what, what the overall ambition is. And when everyone goes around the table saying, we're trying to get to the net zero, we're trying to solve the climate crisis, and they'll look at each other and go, oh, God, I'm trying to do that too. And they know it, but when you hear it, when you, when you absolutely, we have a common goal, then that, a lot of the, the barriers break down. And the other thing that happens is, is if you ask them, and this is going to sound weird, but you say, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Because then it turns out that it's not so much, in many cases, it's not so much ego, ego, I have to fix it, but it's just, I have the responsibility, and if I don't, nobody will. And if you go, well, what does it look like when you do it together? Okay. Then, then it actually releases energy. It's so it's not competition for financial resource. I think it is that too, but it's like, I, I, I'm only going to get the financial resource, and then if my thing doesn't happen, then we won't solve it. So I have to get the money to make sure my thing happens. But in your conversations with CEOs and financiers yeah. now, is it not apparent to you at this stage that there is an abundance of finance for these projects? It's, it, it doesn't seem to be apparent to them. It's amazing. Okay. And you know, somebody said this wonderful thing about, about, about bankers throwing 50s onto the stage. And it's like, I definitely want to go to those conferences. <laughs> uh, but, but really, there is this, this, I've heard again and again, that the capital is there and is dying to be used. And then there's, and part of the bottleneck is people fighting among themselves, and part of the bottleneck is this attitude that says, no, but it takes a long time. I'm coming to you for questions. <laughs> there are roving mics going to be moving around, putting you on notice now. This is your two-minute uh, <laughs> notice. Um, you averted there to uh, COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh in yeah. November. What's going to happen? So Sharm el-Sheikh is going to be a lot, of, because it's an African cop, it's going to be a lot about uh, something that is really worrying me, which is the amount of money that hasn't gone from, from the developed world to the global south, in spite of all the promises. We've promised 200 billion. Yeah. We haven't even made good on the first 100 no, billion. No, we haven't. And, and so it's going to be a lot about loss and damage. It's going to be a lot about what happened to the money that's supposed to be being invested here. And, and it's going to be a lot about resilience and adaptation for the places that already, you know, like your Pakistan, that are already experiencing... Uh, the devastating effects of climate change. Um, so I think that's going to be the focus. But one thing that really concerns me, and, and this is also an opportunity, right? Uh, in, in, so it, there's lots of places in sub-Saharan Africa that are saying, look, you, you burned your fossil fuels. If you don't give us the money to, to leapfrog and to get the new technology, we're going to burn ours. We're going to let our peatlands release their carbon. We're going to burn our resources because we need to develop. And so that's, that's, a, that's a threat, and, and, it, and it's coming out from quite a few DRCs been saying that. Nigeria, well, Nigeria's already doing it, but um, Congo, uh, particularly for the peatlands and for the, resource, the oil resources. But I think that that's actually, there's a, there's a flip side, because it's not just aid anymore. There's a real opportunity for investment in, in new infrastructure in, in Africa that could bring serious returns. And I think, you know, I've been, to, I've been working with some people, brilliant people in Kenya, who say, look, we've got, you've got a problem with an ageing population. We've got this demographic of these brilliant youngsters who are hungry for work and are hungry and, and entrepreneurial, who could be the climate army that's providing these solutions for the world and develop as well. Right. Law of Suez. That means who's the biggest coward? <laughs> <laughs> At the back there, yeah. Um, from all the, the, the uh, from from your presentation and, and all the ob ob observations you have there, have you ever considered that that variation is due to a source other than atmospheric carbon? Um, you tell me what's changed over the last thirty years that wasn't atmospheric carbon, and then tell me. Uh, see, here's here's what's interesting. The IPCC did a very interesting uh, work on this about. Uh, I think the previous report and the one before. And what they did was they did a set of modelling where they looked at all of the changes that happened. And you can explain, the ones that I showed you from 1884, you can explain the times when it went colder, when it went warmer, more volcanic activity, changes in the solar patterns, changes in some, some of the natural cycles in the world that we talk, talk about, that we understand. So they actually modelled it. Went, yeah, you can explain that. Yeah, you can explain that. And over the last 30, 40 years, it should have been flat. And then if you add into the model just one tiny change, you just add into the model the amount of greenhouse gases that we know we've been putting in the atmosphere, 
up it goes in temperature. And then you look at the temperature that you've seen and it matches it exactly. So yes, absolutely, I've considered it and so have the scientists, but the evidence isn't there. There's nothing, there's nothing that we, we know about that changes climate that's actually changed, apart from greenhouse gases, which have exactly as you'd expect. I think that's incorrect. Okay, well, we can talk about it afterwards if you like. I think it's actually substantially correct. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move on to one question from here before I come back to the floor. Um, there's a very scathing opinion piece in the New York Times in August about carbon capture. Any comment? Uh, it, it won't be lost on anybody who paid the slightest bit of attention to uh, IPC's uh, AR6, the last report, that CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, mm -hmm. was rained down on mm -hmm. from a height by the scientists. But we have a, we have a kind of a terminology issue yeah, here, don't we? Yeah, it's a real mess. It's a spectacular mess because I think there's a lot of imprecision in language right across the climate sphere and especially in this area of carbon capture, which is people just say carbon capture and, and use it for a whole range of different things or carbon capture and storage. And CCS, carbon capture and storage, the thing that they were actually worrying about and complaining about is taking carbon from point sources and taking it away and burying it. So that's your, your coal-fired power plant or something like that. So instead of switching from coal to solar, you capture the CO2 and you bury it. And there are problems with that. There are big problems with that because it reduces the efficiency of the coal-fired power so, plant. So for clarity's sake, you're power. talking about extracting the stuff as it is emitted. Sorry, they were talking about what you're talking about is taking the stuff Out that's the already end. there historically Out that needs end. to be removed. Yeah. And the point there is that... Uh, that whether, you know, you can sort of say that's a better solution or that's a better solution. You can do it with wood, you can do it with grinding up rock and spreading it on fields, you can do it with, with, um, with uh, um, direct capture and injecting into geological storage, you can do it with kelp forests in the oceans. There's loads of ways you can actually do it and you might have to choose the best way or the best ways. But the point is we have to do it or we can't get to the climate goal. It's too late, we've run out of runway. Can I get a microphone down here, please, in front of me while I throw you another question here, Gabriel? What is your thought on companies purchasing offsets versus reducing their actual emissions? Hey, I wrote, a, I wrote an op-ed about this in time, like three weeks ago. So, so it sounds like a plant. So um, the, the, it's, it's absolutely clear. Everybody has to reduce as fast as they can. Offsets are, are very last year. If, you, if you're depending on offsets for your net zero plan, uh, that, that strategy is going to have a very, very short shelf life and it's going to start to smell very soon if it's not already smelling. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, the story is that if you want to be net zero yourself, and this is, and we're working with at the moment, my team are working with the, the VCMI, the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity, the Integrity Council, the Voluntary Carbon Market, the ICBCM, and various others who are setting these rules. Basically, here's what it's going to be. If you want to be net zero, the only way you can do that is you either reduce all of your emissions to zero and emit nothing at all, which today is actually impossible, or you reduce as much as you can on a, on a plan, and everything you don't reduce, you remove. So if you put a ton of CO2 into the air, you have to take it back out again. That's the only way you're going to be net zero. That's not an offset, that's a removal. So you reduce whatever you can, and you remove the rest. And then the carbon credits that are kind of called offsets might be a contribution to helping the rest of the world do their thing. But if you're going to be net zero, it has to be a removal. Now, you can hear in front of me. Um, hi, David Canary. I'm self-employed, so I can speak uh, freely, I think. Uh, but um, I'm just going to use your dual uh, citizen status to uh, ask a political question on both sides. Uh, yeah. um, the largest <laughs> political party in Ireland and the majority of political parties in Britain, including... Nor uh, the devolved governments do not believe private finance should be used for infrastructure, energy, or housing. How can the energy transition and the race to net zero be delivered with state funding alone? As what, what, which is the reality politically we are facing? I, I don't think it can. So I, it is. A, it is how, do, a, how do we convince them that? Yeah. <laughs> how do we change the story? How do we change it? And it has to be, you know, I, do, I think it's really interesting that in, in, in most other sectors, it's, it's becoming increasingly clear. This is being led by business. And, and, and many of the governments that, that I've been talking to have been sort of saying, we need to, in fact, the, the European Union at the moment is looking at uh, the carbon market, the, the, the compliance market, and saying we want to test out, we want businesses who will test out to make sure this really works. We don't, you know, the regulators, the people setting the compliance rules say, we don't have a precedent for this. We need to work much more tightly. It's a different kind of relationship between businesses and regulators. But, but also, you know, I think there has to be leverage. 
And we've already talked, how do you release this massive amount of capital that's sloshing around that's trying to be used in this space? And, you know, I don't know what the, what, what the answer is, but I do know that the, the, the approach needs to be to look at the blockages, to find out what, what kind of narrative is needed to show that, that that's the only way to make this happen. Would you advocate carbon removal at the exclusion of large-scale afforestation? Is there any reason not to aggressively pursue both? It is a false dichotomy, it's isn't it? It is a false it? dichotomy. And large-scale afforestation is, in fact, a carbon removal. So it's, the problem with it is that if, you, if, you, if you're afforesting in places where uh, the trees are likely to burn, or if you're just putting up a big plantation of, of uh, all one species instead of considering things like biodiversity, you're making the afforested forest vulnerable to, to die back again. And so you don't get a, a long-term carbon removal. But, but if you make a forest which is actually in a place that's not going to burn and it's got lots of biodiversity so it's resilient, then that can last for hundreds, thousands of years. It's a really good idea. It, it comes back again, doesn't it, to the, my solution, your solution. Yeah, exactly. That, that yeah. kelp and forestry are just as much part of carbon removal Absolutely. as that a big array in Texas. Absolutely. And then the and carbon tree, I'm a very big fan of trees, but it has to be a tree put in a place where it's not going to be chopped down and it's not going to burn. Okay. Final question to you before I let you go. Are you optimistic? <laughs> I, get this, I get this question a lot. Or people will say, how can you be optimistic? How can you come up here with this sunny smile when you put all that terrifying stuff up there? And, and I, the, the thing is... Uh, when I You're saw, Irish. I'm oh. Irish. <laughs> when I saw that plaque, it should be terrifying. I was there with that glacier that disappeared, and I was thinking... You know, there were 50, 50 metres of ice, and it's not there, and, and this is real. I know it's happening. I kind of touched it, and it was actually horrifying. But there was also, weirdly, and maybe this is the Irish in me, right? It was inspiring. Because I saw those words. It says, we know what's happening and what needs to be done. And so it's like, OK, we know what's happening and what needs to be done. Let's get on with it. It's, it's, it's really... Um, I, I don't... I, you know, optimists are people who... You know what? Optimism and pessimism, they're both fatalistic. They're, they're, let, me give, let me give you this. They're both fatalistic. Something's going to happen. I have no control over it. And if I'm optimistic, it's because I'm a sunny person. If I'm pessimistic, I'm a miserable person. But I can't change the okay. future. Let, let me reframe the question to you then, please. Are you optimistic that we can be, that we will be the greatest generation, the ones that solve this problem for humankind? Do I believe we will be the greatest generation who has solved? Well, I believe one or two things will happen. Either we do that, or we'll all go down in flames. And so I'd rather do that. So um, you tell me. Can I, do I, do I have, should I? Should I believe this? What do you think? Hands up if, you think, your, if you think we're going to fix it. This is your <laughs> come by, uh, come to God moment. Because I, I'm, join not, hands. I'm not going to do it on my own. But really, I'm, I'm absolutely serious about this. We are the ones who will fix okay. it. All right. Don't let me down. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Gabriel Walker. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gabriel. OK, uh, I'm going to pose another question that I want your feedback on while I invite our next panel up onto the stage because I'm conscious of the fact that, once again, we're running behind time, so let's use it efficiently. Uh, to... Uh, um, uh, amaze, impress and astound you uh, as part of our final panel on financing energy projects. Can I please call up now Owen Hartigan, the Head of Origination and Project Finance in Bank of Ireland, Cyril Perrin, Managing Director of NEON in Ireland, Justine Boisseau, Vice President of Energy at Société Générale, Luis Duran, Director of Energy Climate Action and Infrastructure at AIB, and Murren Hernan, Financial Services Partner in Mason Hayes in Curran, all of whom are going to be ably chaired by Will Carmody. And while they're sorting themselves out again, let me once again ask you to pick up your phones and ask you uh, a question to which the answer, I hope, is going to be fairly obvious. Should Ireland speed up or slow down the pursuit of its decarbonisation goals? What now, folks, is our response to the situation, the predicament that we find ourselves in now with an energy crisis that means that we are going to have to take our fossil fuels wherever we can get them, whatever form they come to us in, should the decarbonisation agenda just be politely set aside until we get ourselves out of this present difficulty or not? Your answers on this third and final question, please. And I'm not going to give you any more time than that because really the answer I thought should have been fairly obvious to everybody who was in this room. Slow down 4%. Who are you? Stick your hands up. 
We'll take you outside or do a darkened room and explain it all to you all over again. All right, folks, thank you very much. Our final panel now under the able chairmanship of Will Carmody. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Philip. Uh, Philip has introduced our panel. We have a nice mix here now of um, funders, uh, uh, both Irish, uh, domestic Irish and international, um, and also um, an international developer as well, a, a user of those funds. So uh, we should have a nice uh, conversation in that context. Uh, so the money slot of the, <laughs> of the conference, uh, the previous speaker that referred to uh, bankers throwing wads of 50 around the stage, I'm not sure if the, the guys have brought their, their, their wads with them. I don't think there'll be that type of Wolf of Wall Street behaviour, but we'll, uh, we'll, get some, we'll get some insights from them um, in any event. So I think actually in Gabriel's um, address, the, the comment from Mark Carney really resonated about the requirement for um, a massive reallocation of capital <coughs> to achieve uh, this um, net zero target uh, that, that we have to achieve. It, it, was really, it was really relevant, obviously, in the context of this panel. I think it's been estimated that um, 125 billion euro of capital will need to be deployed uh, to achieve um, uh, uh, and to be invested in low carbon technologies and renewable energy infrastructure uh, to achieve Ireland's uh, climate action plan objectives by 2030. Um, that's just in Ireland. So that, that's an enormous amount of money. Uh, and that's not going to be sourced just from um, within our own resources. That's going to require investment, um, both from, from, from Irish investors and, and internationally. And clearly, whilst there's a, there's a clear sort of societal and environmental imperative uh, to make this um, investment, um, uh, banks and investors and pension funds you know, also have to behave in a in a fiscally responsible and prudent way, as well as uh, an environmentally friendly way. Um, and funders have to make an assessment of the, the risks and the return uh, from, um, from projects and, and, and technologies and industries as well. So all, getting that balance right between all of that, that's, um, that's really, uh, really, I suppose, what we're going to try and get to the, to the bottom of uh, here in our conversation now. Um, so I suppose maybe, Owen, starting, start, starting with yourself, um, uh, in the context of the wider um, sort of e economic environment that we find ourselves in, everybody's aware of the challenging conditions that are coming and the, the headwinds that we're facing into. I suppose in that context, uh, you know, is, is, are you still confident there will be debt financing available for, for the development of these projects that we, that, that we need to do to meet our sustainability commitments? Yeah, look, I, I think there is. I think, you know, we've heard a number of people say today, kind of, you know, there's, there's a, a ample liquidity across across the uh, capital stack, and I, I think that will continue to be the case, kind of, I think we are hitting a number of headwinds, you know, and kind of, if I look at, kind of, if and when new opportunities kind of come across our desk, kind of, I think, you know, a couple of the things that we're currently looking at in, in the environment, or in this current environment, kind of, we're looking at, number one, at the volatile interest rates, you know, and kind of looking, looking at, kind of, um, looking at the viability of the project as a result of that volatility because you, you have to remember kind of bids are put into res and and by the point in time it may go from bid to offer to final offer to financial close there's a significant period of time there and i think you know kind of all we have to do is look at the res one projects to see there kind of you know was in terms of it was an interest rate environment where people were prudently modeling zero you know kind of you know i check my emails this morning to see where we are in terms of kind of interest rates kind of noting that the ECB is looks like they're going to flex them again and it's, it's another 30 basis points increase as of this morning on a five-year interest rate swap so you're looking at from a zero to 2.3 2.4 percent this morning mm. that's that's not that's not talking about bank margin mm. so kind of look I think I think that is is something which is exceptionally volatile at the moment it needs to be considered um, you know kind of I think the, the liquidity the ample liquidity there should ensure it can be mitigated. I think the sophistication kind of of, of, of equity in developers kind of um, but it is something that carries a risk up front for developers and I think it's it's not acknowledged. Similarly and, and look this is going going straight into the usual it's 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 nothing innovative on my side but again if we come back and we look early days at, at an opportunity and the viability of a project 
you're looking at a complete mismatch between your revenue line and now your OPEX line. So you are, you know, there's zero inflation on your revenue. You're looking at a, you know, a, your OPEX, which is, is largely tied to your operation and maintenance. And, and you're looking at inflation and running it, you know, maybe, you know, well, what is that inflation number? You know, I'm not going to draw out a number, but it's, it's it, again, that threatens debt serviceability in terms of your cash flow. And it's, it's stuff that needs to be considered. And it's, it's that passage in time from, from, bidding to res through to uh, financial close where the SPV, the project, the developer is taking that risk. Um, there's no risk sharing kind of under a res regime, which is what we may see kind of on a public-private procurement where there is a risk share. And I think, you know, that can be detrimental. And we're certainly in kind of one of the most volatile states we've been in, in, in you know, kind of my 10, 12 years in this sector. Mm. Okay, very good. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Sir, um, as, a, as an international um, investor and actually the, a, a developer with the honour of having connected the first ground-mounted solar um, project uh, in Ireland, which your project in Millville and Wicklow, um, like, what do, you, do you see any particular challenges or things that, that, that you, know, you feel are going to, are going to you know, need to be addressed just in that high-level high environment where, we're, where you're looking at raising finance? Sure, international but local. I'm living in Dublin to be, uh, yep. to be clear. Um, so, uh, to be honest, this is probably the easiest panel, so thank you very much for inviting me to that <laughs> one. ESG was probably much more uh, <laughs> delicate, uh, as well as uh, developing offshore wind farms in, in Ireland. Um, about the financing in Ireland, uh, um, of course, we are in a much more complex environment than we were at the time of RES-1, mm. at the RES-1 bid. I'm not talking about the RES-1 delivery, mm. but at the time of RES-1 bid, we were all very optimistic. We had uh, exceptional uh, low prices for the supply of solar modules. Uh, we had very low interest rate. And when we see all what we went through to connect to the grid of our uh, first solar farm, I mean, a lot of things happen. Mm. A lot of things happen. Um, and the, to ch touching to a, a couple of, uh, of few points, um, um, the, maritime, the maritime route to import our solar modules, it's a, it's a, it's a good example, has been uh, um, knocked a lot by the impact of COVID. So we had to transport our solar modules through Russia mm. by train uh, for some, um, mm. at some point, and, it will, and it's not possible anymore. So, I mean, the um, transportation uh, has been uh, hit a lot, uh, as well as the supply chain. Mm. All the countries around have, uh, have currently a very aggressive politic in terms of uh, building more renewables. Uh, and so the, dev the developers are struggling now to, uh, mm. to find their solar models, to find their turbines. Mm. And of course, uh, this is a situation in which we are right now at the time of race two. Mm. And so we are bidding in a, in a much, with much more uncertainties. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, um, even more than race one, we feel the strong support of the lenders, so of the, of the, of the financials. I'm not saying that because I'm with <laughs> the potential lenders here. Um, but we, we really do feel uh, this appetite for the sector. But um, we, we have to bid in a, in a much more uncertain world and we need to keep a bankable sector to make sure we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go forward. Okay, very good. Yeah, obviously, as a, for Ireland, as an island, with the, the supply chain challenges actually are quite acute for us as well, in, in, in particular. And um, just seeing, um, uh, you have actually you have an, internet, uh, an interesting perspective here because as well as being a, a lender active in Ireland, you have quite a wide remit across Europe um, and um, the Middle East as well. Um, and actually it was the funder of that uh, first project to, to be connected, solar project. Um, uh, there'll be a, there's a, a lot of competition. Whilst there's, whilst there's a lot of funding out there, there's also a lot of competition for that funding um, are there any particular challenges for Ireland in that context in sort of attracting, attracting funding to projects here? Any particular challenges or any issues that you see particularly relevant? Well, it's true that as an international funder, you will also compare yeah. with other countries and similar schemes. For instance, uh, you know, an obvious one would be comparing to the UK CFD. Uh, so, of course, there are a few... Uh, there are a few things which are a bit less um, favorable, for instance, the fact that it's not indexed, or, mm -hmm. or maybe the fact that um, uh, there is this uh, COD long-stop date 
where actually uh, the developer has to take the grid connection risk. Um, and uh, as a lender, usually we don't really like when things are outside of the control. control. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, uh, you know, REST1 has been a great test because it, it has shown that it's bankable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, lenders just have to take the specificities of the, you know, Irish uh, feed-in premium and mm -hmm. just see what they can uh, do around this. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you know, this uh, non-indexation, -index uh, lenders will just look at, in a way, that they want a bit more buffer, uh, you know, in case of, uh, of uh, you know, inflation, which is not in line with what we expected at the time of, uh, of looking at the financing. Yeah. For this COD long-stop date, we would look, for instance, at, um, you know, making sure that there is sufficient buffer mm -hmm. uh, and making sure we're comfortable enough with you know, the construction uh, timeline mm. uh, and that, you know, in case of, uh, of delays, uh, we can uh, actually um, uh, be sure that, uh, you know, the developer is not going to lose uh, uh, this uh, uh, feed-in premium. So mm. basically, there are a lot of risks also that uh, lenders are now familiarized with. Uh, so for instance, there used to be, you know, a focus also on curtailment, negative prices and, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we got familiarized, you know, looking at other projects elsewhere. So, mm -hmm. so Ireland is definitely a market that is still uh, really attractive. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, as an international funder, we would just try to uh, basically uh, structure the financing around this specific, uh, specific issues. Okay, very good. Very good. Excellent. So maybe actually to delve into some of those challenges in, in a little bit more detail. Um, the, in the poll that uh, Owen and, and Peter mentioned earlier on, we also had a question asking um, respondents what they viewed as the biggest risk for uh, investors and financiers uh, looking at funding uh, renewable energy projects. And actually over 80% of the respondents identified policy risk as um, the greatest risk, you know, risk of policy not being sufficient, obviously change of policy and um, so you touched on res and the res support. Um, uh, that's one particular area, obviously, that's 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 very important uh, and, and dependent on um, uh, maintenance of government policy around that. Um, is that something um, you know in particular that you know you you are satisfied with how it's operating? How have you seen it evolve? Maybe even between res one and and, and res two. I'm not sure I'll be as politically correct as uh, <laughs> the panelists in the offshore round. Um, so if I go back to, uh, to their question, which was uh, how optimistic are you mm. about uh, the 2030, uh, the achievement of uh, the 80% renewable electricity uh, by 2030, I have to say it's that way. Um, with the current framework, we won't make it. Mm. Let's be clear. Um, Paul uh, rightly mentioned it. Uh, we've got projects that uh, at awarded, uh, were awarded a connection at, uh, at ECP uh, to the two a year ago. And we are only now starting the engagement with the DSO and the TSO mm. uh, on part of the project to get a grid offer eventually for Q2 2023, mm. a year and a half to know where we'll connect, at what cost and by when. Mm. So with the current framework, no, we won't make it. Mm. Let's be honest. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think I'm not an optimistic person. I mean, uh, ask me about the Rugby World Cup next year, I'll be very optimistic. <laughs> so that, that's really a question of, and, and to continue being optimistic, uh, is there things we can change? Mm. And I see a lot of consultations ongoing currently at a government level on the so private wire, hybridization. So there is a conscious, everybody's conscious that there is a big issue currently. We won't make it if we do not change things. And, uh, and the DSO and the TSO are, um, are working on that. Mm. Um, so I don't need to speak about, uh, about the planning and, and the grid. Mm. Um, if we stick to the question of the financing, which is the purpose of that panel, and, and we see what the impact of the current financing, uh, the current financing cost on the REST auction, we've made a very sim simple calculation between REST 1 and REST 2. What was the impact on the tariff in euros per megawatt hour of uh, the increased interest rate. We're not even talking about uh, banks taking more margins, mm. We're just talking about the simple mechanical impact of the increase of interest rate. We're talking about some 16 euros per megawatt hour. So from an average price at rest one at 74 euros per megawatt hour, mm. without talking about supply chain, without talking about all of that, mm. mechanically speaking, 
we were increasing the cost of producing renewable energy to at least 90 euros per megawatt hour. So no surprise that the average price at race two was uh, closer to 100 if you impact on top of the financing costs or the rest of, um, of the contract. Mm. Um, what, what would be very important to not um, lose uh, the bankability of the Irish sector in terms of challenge we'll have in the future, and it has been mentioned many times today and, and by Justin right now, will be the grid challenge. Mm. Um, and it will go worse if we do not again work on the policy. Mm. More and more the project will face increased curtailment and constraints. And, uh, and more and more, it will make the lenders worried mm. about uh, at what point it will become unsustainable and, and not bankable. So this one will be a, a critical one. Um, another sector we've not uh, discussed much today, we've focused more on, uh, on onshore uh, wind farm, solar and, and offshore. We've touched a bit to the point of the, of the batteries. Uh, Financing batteries in Ireland currently is non possible. It's not possible for new projects. Some projects developed a couple of years ago benefited already for some um, uh, support and, and are being built. So we are having uh, um, things in the newspaper showing new batteries being built. That's fantastic. But there is currently, we are going through now a couple of years where it will be very difficult or impossible to finance a battery mm. because there is no visibility from 2024, 2025, on what will be the mechanism to remunerate all the services we will need mm -hmm. to have a grid uh, with zero emission. Mm -hmm. And if we want to have, it was 70, it's now 80, and we all want to have 100% renewable energy on that grid, it will go through a massive addition of batteries. Mm -hmm. And so we could become, at some point, late uh, on the development of, um, of those batteries. Mm -hmm. um, Finally, um, to go back on the question of the appetite for lenders mm. to the Irish market uh, and, and having that uh, eventually view as uh, international and, and local developers, what's very positive is that uh, from race one to race two, and, and despite the fact that on some aspect, race one has not been completely a success, when we see the delivery rate of race one, there is some questions still about that. Um, we see the lenders uh, with even more appetite on race two than they were on race one. In particular, we see local banks much more aggressive on race two than they were on race one. And, and it's interesting to understand, so eventually that's a question for you, <laughs> if, uh, if it is because solar technology was new in the Republic of Ireland and now, I mean, we've delivered it and the lenders, the local lenders are much more comfortable to go for this yeah. as they were already on, on the wind for, for decades. Mm -hmm. So that, that will be a, 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 an interesting point. The, the last challenge, and again, that question for the banks, um, we, Ireland competes with, so we are talking a lot about uh, a collaboration between all the countries and, and in Europe around that energy crisis. And I think that that's crucial to keep that collaboration. We would not be here if there was not that support, European support. But at the same time, uh, we've got to understand that all the countries are making major steps mm -hmm. uh, forward to renewable energies. And we'll be all competing for um, resources, mm. for so the supply chain, for human resources. Mm. I mean, uh, we are all struggling to hire in all the countries. Mm -hmm. So we'll be struggling for those uh, human resources. And, and it's an open question, uh, um, eventually, for financing. Um, as of today, there is an appetite, a general appetite for renewable energy. If Ireland does not manage to um, keep a very uh, interesting environment with a scale, with uh, uh, no, uh, not political risk, there is no political risk, but uncertainty in the policies, yeah. could at some point those lenders already very busy financing everywhere in Europe turn to other countries? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay, thanks, sir. Yeah, so the policy certainty is very important in that regard. Then, um, uh, Louise, I suppose we've been chatting there about sort of, sort of some big macro issues as well as that. There can be very nuanced um, and specific issues that can have actually a very material effect on financing 
uh, and it's been touched on already, the treatment of constraint, for example, in the system that actually can have a real uh, significant impact on the bankability of a project and there's some sort of issues around it at the moment, I know, for funders. Is that something you've seen, you know, really, really, really cause a difficulty in, in, in looking at the financeability and bankability of projects? Um, yes, well, I think um, policy certainty, as you say, is, is, is the common theme here. Um, when, when we're looking at projects, uh, certainly looking at issues like curtail, curtailment and constraint, big problem. Curtailment and constraint are not the issue in itself, but it's just receiving the strong signals we need from whether the regulator or the government uh, in terms of how, how we should look at these issues going forward. As bankers, we tend to adopt models, or, or our lending models look at 15, 20 years. Um, and if we have fundamental uncertainty, whether it's regarding how projects will be curtailed through a grand, grandfathering scheme or pro rata, or whether it's how they will be remunerated for that curtailment, if we have fundamental uncertainty about that, that makes it very difficult for us um, to, to make sound lending decisions on the back. Of, 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 the, of those projects, right? So it, it, ultimately what it leads to is it, it kind of it leads us to take more conservative views mm. um, on those deals. And that's not a good thing because a more conservative view means less debt, mm. means a higher cost of capital for the developer. And what's that going to mean? It's going to mean that developer at the next res auction going in, bidding higher, higher price. bidding higher, and bidding higher is higher energy prices for the consumer. So I think on the, on the, on the on the subject or on the theme for days, there's that, that call to action uh, from, from whether it's the regulator, the, the government, to make sure that these policies, whether it's the implementation of the clean energy package uh, and all the things that will come out of that, which you know certainly very positive things, needs to happen. It needs to happen quickly so that us as bankers can perform our role and can, 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 can provide that clarity or have that clarity with which to lend money. And that's super important. Curtailment's one of them. Uh, certainly a common theme. I was thinking, just coming just on my way here today, I know there's one, one in particular. I know, for example, the last res, or the first res scheme that we had introduced the requirement for performance bonds. Mm. Uh, that was a big theme. We didn't have that before. Um, I'm, not, I'm not against performance bonds as per se. I think they're a good way of making sure that you keep um, um, speculators out of the market. Mm. But um, I don't think a lot of thought went into how those bonds would be procured does the Irish market have a number of, of bond providers that can provide all these type? And I, I can tell you that even it's just something that hasn't been thought out properly. And even on the last day of that deadline by which a number of bonds needed to be procured, a whole bunch of non-AIB customers would have been ringing the banks and asking, could this kind of stuff be procured in 24 or 48 hours, which is typically not very possible. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's a problem because I know for a fact that a number of projects were not able to secure these bonds in Res 1, handed back their, their offers. Um, and it wasn't through lack of funds. It's just, just through lack of a proper infrastructure yeah. and clear vision, clear policy and direction from the people that are drafting the policy to know, are the things that we're asking for, can they be delivered? Mm -hmm. OK, very good. Um, that's a bit, yeah, cliff edge uh, sort of panic that you don't want <laughs> at, the, at the last minute. Mm -hmm. um, ju just in relation to that um, point around uh, constraint and the application of the rules, Murren, just the, the current legal position around that and just how, how that's managed, um, uh, mm -hmm. what, like, what, what, what is that current, um, current sort of framework? So Louise obviously touched there on the grandfathering um, position that's developed in the last number of years in the Irish market and I suppose that's derived from Articles 12 and 13 of the 2019 Directive which introduced a distinction in treatment for pre-2019 and post-2019 projects. That was then implemented in Ireland um, following a lengthy consultation um, with plenty of robust submissions. Um, and a further distinction then was made between whether uh, a project would deem to be um, firm or non-firm. Mm. So really, I suppose, as we're looking forward, I wouldn't say that there is a strong potential for any material change there. Um, unfortunately, I think that if there are to be any successful challenges to the implementation as it's been carried through in Ireland, that's likely to be around the firm versus non-firm and whether projects are going to be compensated for their constraint or not. Okay. Um, unfortunately, then it comes back to the, the earlier point that I suppose some of the panellists here have touched on, which is the, the strong need for investment in grid infrastructure, and really that is kind of where we're going to see the material change in the constraint approach going yeah, forward. Yeah, actual, actual physical in, in, infrastructural investment as opposed to changing of the rules. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
very good, very good. Um, Owen, um, someone with quite a bit of experience uh, lending in the Irish market, um, and in fact, Bank of Ireland was the Mason is current client on my first renewables energy project about 20 years ago. Say you were in primary school, you much more fre remain much more fresh faced than I am. But uh, you know, having having that that sort of um, long perspective on the market, is there any particular characteristics about the Irish market that produce uh, challenges for lenders? Like it's a it's a small market, for example. Yeah, yeah I think it is, and I think look, look sir, I'll touched on it as well, and it, and it comes back to scale. And, and if we look at kind of where we are today, and again, you know, this has been mentioned throughout the, the conference, it's mentioned in absolutely every conference you go to, is, is the level of liquidity there, you know, and, and, and being honest, I think my MD thinks I'm making up bank names at this point in time when I have a sit down with them on a monthly basis and I say well there's now 10, 12, 13 funders bidding on term sheets mm. kind of, but I think that's there because people see scale from the outset and they see the grand ambitions of Res 1 and it's not just the funding side I think it's the equity side as well people can begin to see the scale and when you see scale you can build a business plan mm. you can invest in it you can in invest in that geography and unfortunately, where we sit today, sorry, we look at Res 1, <clears throat> and there hasn't been a huge amount deployed out of Res 1, so there hasn't. Mm. We're sitting here in Res 2, um, and it's, it's, it's volatile. It's, yeah. it's, it's how much is going to be deployed. So I think it's in terms of... slow to get to It's out. slow. It's, it's very slow. And I think even if you look at what we are bringing through... You know, we're bringing through stuff which, you know, kind of is in the Irish context, and, and it is difficult, and we have to remember, we are in a small island, but we're bringing stuff through that we would categorise as large projects of 60 to 80 megawatts, which, you know, if I turn to my right and I ask you guys, is, is that large? You know, I think you would probably, you know, smirk, and, and it's absolutely not. It's a one-funder project. Mm -hmm. So it is. So I, I think that's the challenge. It, it is that scale. It's delivering that scale from the outset. It comes back to policy, so it does, and, and, and policy being fit for purpose. Kind of, but is in kind of if we do have multiple auctions, whereby there is not going to be an uptake, that the business plan quickly erodes. Mm -hmm. You know, funders will quickly, you know, pack up and go. And we've, I've seen it. I've seen it before, so I have kind of, and, and I think equity will as well. And, and then we, we, we will be left with. We've gone, it's private industry is driving the growth of renewables and we will have less and less people. We will have less capital, we will have less bank debt to, uh, and competition, which is ultimately, you know, designed a CFD, which is designed to drive down the price. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that won't be the case, unfortunately. So I think it's, it's we, need to, we need to address that scale, kind of, I think, I think Philip mentioned it, you know, kind of in the previous session, it takes a long time to do things. That needs to be addressed, it really does. Yeah, okay, very good. Um, and Justine, maybe with that international perspective then as well, we've heard a lot about some of the challenges here. Does a lot of what you hear sound familiar to you in the context of other markets as well? Uh, or are there any, you know, quite specifically Irish things that you've seen that, that, that you think uh, uh, sort of produ produce challenge lending into the market? Uh, actually, yeah. yeah, I'm very aligned to my fellow... Uh... Uh, banks actually, from whether from an international or local uh, perspective, I think yeah. we we agree that uh, yeah, it's the same issues that uh, need to be uh, structured around and discussed. Uh, so, yeah. so I think we are we are very much uh, aligned uh, aligned here. Um, but yeah, for now, Ireland still is uh, is attractive. But yeah. Yeah, there is this issue of scale because if it is just one small project uh, for a bank, it's so much work that. Uh, is it, uh, is it worth it? So yeah. we, we need to also have a, some kind of a sizable project to, to finance. Um, and yeah, as I said before, um, uh, a few of the challenges is, uh, you know, when you compare to other, uh, to other markets, uh, what are the weaknesses of uh, what is uh, proposed? So for instance, the fill-in premium, and, mm -hmm. and we, uh, we just discussed all the different uh, risks. Um, but still, uh, Ireland stays, uh, you know, rest one did show that there was appetite and rest two as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's still a very uh, attractive, uh, attractive market for, for bank. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think banks are also following up very closely what uh, are the trends and how it's going to, mm. to develop. And, uh, and uh, also, you know, on other sectors like uh, ORES, 
mm. uh, what uh, yeah. uh, what is going to be uh, to be done there as well to make yeah. sure that uh, the pro the, uh, any offshore uh, projects are actually mm. financeable as well. Yeah. So but I that, think there is a lot of. Uh, yeah, and that's an opportunity, of course, obviously to address maybe that scale issue. That's a, a place where. Ireland can actually develop um, a pipeline um, of a lot of very large projects, um, exactly. obviously with the uh, abundant resource <laughs> surrounding us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, if you, if you look at that and you look at that scale and the pipeline, and it's, sometimes it's about being creative as well. And it's 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 we look at kind of like in Ireland we've been doing wind for twenty odd years, and certainly we we as a bank have, and we've been doing it through AER to to raise one kind of um, and hopefully raise two um, at some point kind of. But you know, kind of we look at a lot of stuff in the AER schemes, in the refit schemes that you know would have been considered kind of you know kind of uh, first in class sites mm -hmm. that are have you know two hundred and fifty kilowatt, five hundred kilowatt turbines. Um, you know, and we need to see a blueprint for how they repower mm. and, and, and not how they repower removing the risk of, of planning. You know, kind of appreciate it's probably not the best time they won't want to repower at the moment, but hence why I use the word blueprint. Mm. But I think we need to see that because, you know, I mean, if we, if we looked at it, and it's, it's, it's a piece of work I'd love to actually just do myself and see kind of how, if you, if you take the 250 kilowatt, 500 kil kilowatt, and you're replacing with a three megawatt, that's a substantial increase in capacity mm -hmm. for infrastructure which is already in the ground but may just need to be upgraded yeah. um, so, so I think that's something that needs to be given a bit of thought because it, it is it is a good opportunity, opportunity. very good um, just to remind everyone as well at this point Slido for for questions and um, we'll uh, we'll pick those up then at the at the end of the session as well and we've so we've we've sort of uh, spent a bit of time here now talking about the challenges uh, that we see lending into the sector Maybe as well then to look at the you know the opportunities, um, um, or maybe just for for yourself as well. Do you see um, are there opportunities for easy wins? You know to improve conditions. Yeah, in the I unintentionally get a very good segue into that with the repower. Yeah. I should have saved it for this session, <laughs> so I should have. But um, hindsight's a great thing. No, look, I think there is, and it would be very easy to sit up here and you know kind of ridicule policy um because let's be honest the last three years that we've seen in this world you know it, it's absolutely changed the world yeah. has changed you know kind of and, and then the current geopolitical situation you know it's 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 good to hear you know justine mention kind of that you know from a from a international perspective, you know they're still looking at Res, and and, and you know a you know huge amount of developers, a huge amount of funders look at Res, and Res is Res is very good, as was Refit One, Refit Two. Mm -hmm. I think it's how we make amendments and how we tweak for the current environment, and I think that's how a policy will be judged. And and coming back to the scale and, and achieving the scale of we want to deliver X megawatts in Res One, we want to deliver X megawatts in Res Two. The passage of time in the current environment we're in is exceptionally volatile you know something that was fit for purpose three and a half years ago may need to be tweaked doesn't mm. have to be materially changed but may need to be tweaked you know and for me a couple of them look again the easy wins kind of uh, justine mentioned it is, is is the long stop date you know kind of we we had we had 18 months of a construction shutdown so we did kind of um you know supply chain issues and having a cliff edge you know, long stop date really does not make sense if what we're trying to achieve is decarbonisation mm. and putting renewables on the system. It doesn't. So, kind of, I think, you know, kind of looking at that and, and, and kind of bringing the amendment kind of to the forefront, kind of, we don't really have to look far. You look across the water to the UK and, you know, you can see obviously there's not the same hard kind of long stop date on energisation on the back end. Mm. Developers can elect kind of to to defer their res and and go into a go into a merchant nose period kind of and and you know kind of some people may say that's you know kind of it's not what we want from a CFD because it's given 100% upside to the developer. But you know I'm pretty sure those res one developers need upside because when they sat and built their business case, they did not envisage the three years that we're sitting here kind of um, and the, the cost and the cost in the exactly and, and, and the rates going from zero to you know I priced a five year swap this morning at 2.3. I meant to I meant to price kind of we'll say an indicative 16 plus two kind of just to see or 18 plus two kind of but 
you know, so, so they didn't kind of, so I think we need to kind of just, you know, add little levers like that. That's mm. not going to cost money. It's not going to, it's not yeah. going to add to the PSO kind of, so kind of, I think those two kind of, if we want to look back and see and, and, and say we delivered under a res, mm. you know, it needs to be tweaked kind of, um, for me, another opportunity is, is, and I'll touch on it very quickly, is just it's, it's, it's about kind of um, a route to market. It's, it's I'd like to see utility PPAs, mm. you know, and pure utility PPAs, not, not, with a, not with a res sitting behind it. You know, I think when we look at kind of, we look at kind of onshore wind, we look at solar, they're proven established technologies, you know, they don't have to go route to market through a through a sovereign support scheme, you know. And I think again, we look across the water to the UK. We, we you know, there's some very strong off takers over there who are publicly saying we've designed utility PPAs which are fit for purpose for project finance. Mm. And I think you know, if 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 we can utilise that stream, kind of, um, you know, that will free up kind of government funding and and government resource mm. to look at the next stage of what we need for decarbonisation, such as hydrogen, such as you know, kind of floating offshore and I, and I think that's needed as well yeah okay very good in uh, maybe just in respect of some of those points that Owen made around um, uh, sort of tweaking um, the the existing framework where like what is the is there flexibility you know within the the res rules say for example for some of those movements that that, that Owen mentioned yeah, I'd, I'd echo a lot of what Owen said about trying to work with what we have in place already, which is, you know, really quite a positive political attitude and a positive legislative background. Mm. And really, if we could leverage and expand on what's there already within the powers of, you know, the, the legislation that's in place, I think that would, as Owen said, you know, create a lot of flexibility in the market um, without adding cost. So mm. Owen mentioned there about Res 2 and the, the long stop date and I suppose the difficulties that that might bring when we're trying to reach a point where we're getting as many megawatts on the grid as possible. Mm. Um, I guess there is discretion for the minister within those terms and conditions to amend them if he sees fit, provided it's in line with a, a general renewable energy directive um, kind of ideology. Um, but I think as well, there'd be an opportunity to look at things outside of that. For example, as Owen mentioned there, the, the exit from res, if you, if you have an offer, there's really only one mechanism one clean mechanism at the moment um and you have to be post cod and you have to give 12 months notice which obviously keeps a project in for for much longer um if they try to do it before that there there are some negative consequences for them uh, including including missing the opportunity to bid in further res auctions for example um and i just think between the long stop date the exit and then maybe looking at something like the force majeure provisions you'd create a lot more opportunity there and it's certainly easily done mm. I think some of the previous panels as well, and I know we've been talking about planning a bit, but there are probably some, again, fairly minor amendments we could look at there. Um, Deirdre Nagel, uh, my colleague in the planning department on the first panel this morning, mentioned the recent amendments around flexibility where you have more efficient technology. So that would obviously be really positive to see. Mm. Um, Owen obviously mentioned as well about repowering, and there's an EU directive that hasn't been transposed here yet, but I think we've an opportunity there as well to implement that in as flexible terms as possible and really permit those projects that are already, as Owen says, connected in already um, and, and ensure that they stay on the grid and continue to contribute. But the last thing that I would point out is at the moment we have a relatively limited ability. Um, it's, it's really limited to strategic infrastructure developments to go back in for a non-material development. And I think if we could look at that and look at an amendment that would maybe expand that to a broader application, similar to what you have in the UK, mm. it would again probably free up some of the planning process um, where you fast track basically small amendments to a planning permission that won't materially, mater materially impact the, the actual project on the ground. Okay. Yeah, and just on that planning point, um, Louise, you often see planning permissions are obtained maybe three or two or three years before they actually get to the point of talking to funders and technologies change and things happen in the meantime, like is that a particular issue that you find um, you know troublesome when you're when you're assessing a, a project for for bankability and, and doing that credit assessment? Yes, it's, it's, it's quite... <laughs> short answer. Okay, next question. <laughs> it, it, it's a bit of a nightmare to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, you, you know, we all know how long it takes to develop. A you know, wind farm project years, right? Five, seven, eight, I've seen 15 years for some. Um, and of course, uh, 
the, the constantly evolving, changing technology, right, which could sometimes lead to changes in the equipment, and that sometimes changes in the planning requirements. Um, and it, it, it could sometimes be very heartbreaking to see that, um, not even necessarily through a change in technology, something to do with the site characteristics or something, you have to change something. And as a funder, you know that's bad news because you know that potentially the project's submitting itself to a two-year window where it can be judicially reviewed, it can be appealed, and all these things that for us are just big red flags as lenders and we just hate them. Mm. So um, I think some sort of fast-track fast track planning um, solution is, is, is a low-hanging fruit, something that our legislators should focus on. We know that they announced a, a fast-track planning process for offshore, and that is obviously very welcome. Offshore is going to be huge, but we have a real energy crisis here now. Offshore is going to take time, and there is a, a very large pipeline of onshore solar, onshore, sorry, solar, onshore wind projects, mm. which can be delivered in a very short window of time. So looking at fast-track planning for projects, I think, is definitely something that, that would be a, what you might call an easy win. Mm. Maybe not, I don't yeah. know. But, um, and, then, and then one other area that I think is, is a problem, we touched on it at the beginning in this panel, it's the impact of macroeconomics, the macroeconomic environment on projects, um, inflation in particular. Owen spoke about it, the, the way the, the top revenue line does, does no longer move in the same direction as the OPEX line. Yeah. Huge problem. Um, so, you know, I think, I think we all understand uh, and, and agree with the imperative of keeping energy costs low, protecting the consumer, making sure energy is affordable, but trying to find a way that the macroeconomic environment does not impact the very ambitious renewable energy targets that we have from being delivered is, is crucial for me. So I would, I, would, I would certainly put on the table some sort of inflation linking for REST projects, possibly a, a partial linking, because we know that not all the costs that they have yep. um, are fixed. I think that's certainly a very, um, a, a very interesting proposition. Um, I see the government today, uh, we're talking about a, a windfall tax mm. on non-renewable on renewable projects, I, I don't know if you could call that um, <laughs> a low-hanging fruit. I think it might upset a few of the people in this room, but, uh, yeah. you, you know, I think um, the other two, particularly for me, I think those, those are things that we, we should be focusing on okay. as an industry to try and just streamline that process and get as many projects built okay. in a short period of time. Very good. Okay. Um, I haven't heard all of that, <laughs> sir. Um, like, do do you still you still have a, an appetite uh, for um, future for con continuing future future investment future projects in Ireland? Do you see other opportunities? Um, you've you've completed this, the solar projects as we mentioned earlier on under under Res. Do you see other other areas where where, where maybe you can have further so, sort of further development in the market? Mm -hmm. um, you know. What makes me very positive about uh, the potential of the Irish market to develop much more than what we currently do is, uh, um, to, to use Gabrielle's words um, earlier today, there is a strong push for energy security and sovereignty. And whilst it was so far more, let's say, kind of a, a political debate or the kind of debate we had uh, within uh, hotels like this one uh, between experts and trying to bring uh, a cleaner world, um, I think this debate around energy is now in each and every house, mm. each and every pub. It is discussed in Ireland because we've suffered a second increase of electricity prices this year, mm. right? And I think it makes uh, each and every Irish person considering now eventually with different eyes mm. what renewable energy could make, should make, yeah. need to make, uh, in Ireland to make sure we control prices and sovereignty, mm. right? I've, I've heard uh, that in France, uh, in, in, on the West Coast, on the beaches uh, this summer, I, I wasn't there, so that's why I say I heard I was in Donegal. <laughs> um, but I heard the debate whilst um, we had some uh, uh, fires in the forest and everything. People were debating about, you know, those offshore wind farms arriving on the west coast of France and how it was impacting um, <laughs> the landscape and everything, those tiny uh, offshore wind farms there. And, and I think something was missing in this discussion um, in France was um, that the increase of electricity price mm. uh, since the beginning of, uh, of that war in Europe is, uh, has been in France of 4%. 
Mm. So you've seen the increase of your electricity bill in Ireland, right? The last one was uh, almost 40%. Mm. In France, it has been limited by government subsidies for the consumer at for, for 4%. All, all consumers, right? yeah. I really do think that when you um, arrive on that same beach and you explain to this person, no, you have to make a choice, right? Either you want those tiny offshore wind farms in your landscape, mm. or you want 40% increase on your electricity bill. Yeah. Make a choice. Yeah. So we're discussing about ESG and having a debate about uh, um, the energy policy in the country. And, and of course, we need to respect uh, the, the, the democracy, the debate. Uh, but we need to build something right now in Ireland through a collaborative approach about what do we want for the country in terms of energy sovereignty. Um, and I really do think that people in Ireland are, are ready to have that debate because currently they are paying the price for eventually a lack of a diversification of the electricity mix into solar, into offshore, into more storage, mm. and, and to continuing the policy uh, we have been here in, in Ireland for already decades, two decades in, uh, no, four decades, mm. uh, in, in the offshore wind. So that makes me very positive about the future of Ireland, that the cautiousness of the, of the population around yeah. that debate on energy. Yeah. Now, um, what is very positive, apart from the debate and the political willingness, is a political act. And in Ireland, there is something which is very important, which is regular auctions delivering scale for financing, yeah. for development and for financing. So we go back to the financing point. I mean, um, currently in, in, the European, in, in Europe in general, so we, we fight for... I already said that for solar modules, for resources, and for financing, it is difficult to attract banks for small tickets, for small projects. The fact that through the race auction, we can deliver portfolio every year of projects makes those portfolio uh, bankable, mm. and, we can, uh, and, and we can develop more. The, the very last point, uh, which is very interesting, we're talking about the route to market. Uh, the corporate PPAs, mm. and there has been a, 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 an enormous shift in the mindset of the corporates. Now we are talking to the CFO because, again, there is a question of security of supply at the right price. Mm. And the corporate, over the last eventually 12 months in Ireland, really shifted their mindset and understood that it is not anymore, we don't fight anymore to work with uh, the big names. Yeah. We've got race, it's working well. Uh, the merchant conditions currently are good enough, mm. so we won't fight to work for those big names, yeah. right? Yeah. So they have to be good and competitive, they have to offer the right terms. Yeah. So those corporates increase the duration of the PPAs. Mm. They took a view on how they can differentiate from RACE, eventually offering indexation, which is not offered by RACE, offering to take the risk or view on the grid connection delay, mm. which is not offered by RACE, and so there is a real new route to market um, in Ireland. Mm, very good. Thanks, sir. I know we're up against it time-wise a little bit now and we're in between you and your lunch, so we'll, 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 we'll wrap up. Um, but maybe just very briefly at the end, um, at the end, um, Justine, having successfully closed now your, your, your first project in Ireland, um, um, does that leave you with a sort of a, uh, was that a satisfactory experience? Does it leave you with a good, a good, good sense of um, further, you know, a desire to do further, further, further funding into the Irish market? Yeah, well, uh, the first one is always the most difficult. Yes. <laughs> because there are issues you don't anticipate. But, uh, yeah. but it's also great, you know, to work with, uh, with clients who already know, like a new one, but it, it really opens the door to more, you know. And now we know what are the challenges. We can anticipate them. Uh, we have definitely a very positive view on, uh, on Ireland and, um, and REST. And, uh, you know, we talked a lot about REST, but yeah, corporate PPAs are also... Uh, an option, you know, financing portfolio with a mix of uh, REST and uh, corporate PPA uh, assets. Uh, we, we've seen it a lot in other markets and, uh, you know, in the Nordics. And uh, we just financed this year on, on a completely non recourse basis a 20 year corporate PPA um, in the Netherlands. So, you know, that's also the kind of thing that, um, that you know, can also be looked at in the context of the Irish market. So definitely there is a lot of appetite, and not just for solar, as I mentioned, also, you know, wind, uh, mm. especially maybe the future offshore wind projects. And, uh, mm. and we also actually, uh, this year, we, uh, 
we acted as a financial advisor for uh, the Green Link interconnector, yeah. uh, which uh, you know is also mm. you know the type of things in um, yeah. very important exactly. strategic project in Ireland. Yeah. Exactly, it was a key project for us, and uh, actually uh, our colleagues from uh, AIB uh, acted as lender as well. So mm. really, uh, there are so many opportunities, and uh, and uh, I think the fact that we we keep on closing deals on the island, different types of assets, shows that there is a strong uh, strong interest. Yeah. Very good. Um, as a conscious of time, I'll, I'll take I'll take one question maybe um, from the questions that have been submitted here because um, uh, it's it's interesting. It goes to the fund fundamentals of um, the financial case for for a lot of the renewables projects. Do you see investment always needing? Uh, support, uh, policy, government support. Soon we're likely to have the majority of generation receiving support, um, but at current energy prices, at, at which point, um, uh, why is it needed going forward? Is it, do you see an, a, a funding, does anybody see a, 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 a willingness to fund into a pure pure merchant environment without, uh, I see you grimacing there, just seeing the thoughts of that, without any support scheme in place? <laughs> Anyone want to take that? <laughs> I mean, what, what I would say is I think we are beginning, what's, I suppose, what's the definition of support? Because we've just touched on kind of corporate PPAs um, and anyone you speak to, CPPAs are exploding. You know, I mean, pricing is pricing being offered kind of a, according to market is, is, is higher than res, it's index linked. So kind of as in terms of we're coming away from that, that sovereign support. Um, in terms of merchant, um, yeah, look, kind of I think... I wouldn't like to try and go in front of a credit committee based on a fully merchant when three years ago we were looking at 55 euro megawatt hour and now we're talking about, you know, day ahead market at 220 and, and it could probably even higher to the 300. Yeah. Kind of, you just have no credibility. It's, it's too volatile. It's, it's yeah. too volatile, being, being honest about it. Kind of, I think, you know, I think the move to a CFD and the squeeze on pricing has meant kind of lenders have had to accept some element of merchant. I've never met a lender that says we love doing merchant. Mm. Everyone seems to say we do it kicking and screaming, but everyone's doing it, including mm. me. Yeah. Um, so kind of there's, there's an element, a small element, which I think kind of people are certainly kind of from my point of view, I think could be accepted. I think full merchant would be exceptionally difficult. And I think it's also important to remember if you're talking about full merchant, then what's the pricing? Mm. Because people talk about full merchant and they'll think project financing, pricing, the premise of project finance is the risk is outsourced from the SPV. Certainty, yeah. uh, it's certainty. So kind of you, you're going to be looking at substantially higher pricing. So kind of um, then, you know, so will that model work? So kind of, but no, look, I think it would be would be challenging. I'm not sure what you guys think. Completely aligned with you. Like <laughs> we, we can accept some element of merchants, but uh, yeah, with, uh, with limits. And uh, yeah, corporate PPA are different. We don't really consider them as merchants. Yeah, yeah it's a fixed, <laughs> fixed price. I like what you said about uh, let's redefine what is the support. Um, let's be clear, the government on race one is making money on uh, the race one project, mm. right? With the current prices of energy and it, will, uh, and it will continue in the future, the government is making money out of the race one. So is he supporting the race one project? Mm. Yes, he supported, yeah. uh, let's say, the, the launch of those projects, right, mm. and supported the fact that those projects are being project financed because they've got visibility on their cash flows, mm. so it's key. But the government is making money, so the taxpayers mm. are getting um, a, benefit. A, a benefit out of, uh, of, and, and of the, that. The right? consu consumer is also getting a benefit because there isn't the same draw on the PSO, um, the, correct. The, the extra piece that's added to everybody's bill for, for the renewable energy piece. That's correct. Piece. Yeah. And so, um, and another example, in, in Finland currently, we are building a, a non-shore 400 megawatt wind farm, right, which is selling electricity to a, a group of corporates, uh, uh, Google, Heineken, Philips, and other corporates who grouped together to purchase electricity. Uh, we are selling electricity below market price. Right. So they are saving money on the electricity. Mm. Uh, and we do that because it allows us to finance, again, to project finance that project. So are they supporting us? Yes, in a way, because mm. it allows us to have visibility on our cash flow and to project finance and to allocate our equity yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. But at the same time, are they supporting us? I mean, are we subsidized? No, we're not subsidized. Yeah. So like, renewable energies are, are not subsidized. Very good. Excellent. Good. Well, to, to, again, to circle back to 
uh, Gabriel's presentation that it's good to hear actually that massive reallocation of capital that's going to be required to support all of this. Um, it does sound like you know that liquidity is there and the structures that are there uh, in the market as well for that capital to, to flow into into projects. So that's that's obviously very encouraging. So look, um, I think we'll release everybody to, to, to their soup and their sandwich and uh, remains just for me to thank the panel to uh, Owen, Cyril, Justine, Louise and Moran. Thank you very much uh, for your contributions. It's been, uh, it's been really informative. Thank you. Yeah. And well, thank you very much as well. Um, look, it's a very, very subjective test to try and decide what are the three takeaways from four and a half hours of very, very dynamic exchange of ideas and conversation. But the first thing that is obviously very striking here is that the, while the challenges are formidable, the opportunities are absolutely enormous here. I'm particularly struck by how it is that we might overcome some of these supply chain issues that are bedeviling us with the building of an indigenous industry in not just offshore wind, but in solar and elsewhere to service those larger companies to whom we are outsourcing. Um, it's also very clear that there is final point that Will just made there, there's an abundance of capital, there's an abundance of also the necessary technology to get us to our 2030 targets, and there's an abundance of willing participants just in this room. There is also, unfortunately though, an abundance of silly stumbling blocks and red tapes and delays. I'm struck not for the first time by the silliness of there being only one month in the year. Uh, September, in which people can make a grid application and then wait 12 months before they get to go again. So these are things that you, as the drivers of change in large part, are going to have to force the agenda on by way of introducing policy certainty, say, here's what's going to happen. But I would caution, picking up on something that Aoife Foley made as a point, while we are in this space that we need to move fast and we need to break things and get things done quickly, there is an obvious tension between developer-led infrastructure and the public interest. And that is to be expected in a country where the legacy of developer-led building is something that we still live with. So be aware, be expecting pushback on what it is that your great big bright idea is. But I would also have confidence, having listened to the last four and a half hours this morning, that the solutions and the creativity to those problems also lie within this room. Before we go, I want to hand you back very briefly to where we started out this morning uh, with the energy partner from Mason Hayes Kern. Owen. Thank, thanks, Philip. And I'll just loom here behind all the bankers. Um, so look, I did, I'll keep you really quick. Just want to say thank you to, to Philip in particular for, for emceeing today. I thought it was excellent for, for Minister uh, Oshin Smith to turn up when he could very well have phoned in sick, given how to hot a topic this is. And I thought um, his, he, gave, he was very open in his views around what, what needs to be done and what can be done in, in Ireland. The, I realised halfway through this morning that we had the wrong name for the conference. So it should have been energy sovereignty in a net zero world. But look, we got there eventually. Um, uh, we have lunch available for everyone. If you're in a rush and you need to get back to the office, there are takeaway boxes. Uh, there is no such thing as a free lunch and no such thing as a free conference. So all I would ask for the, from the attendees is, you know, uh, most of you are clients already, but when you do have legal issues or you do are embarking on something that's new, exotic, interesting, whatever it may be, just try and have a think of whether there might be someone in MHC who might be able to give you a steer or a hand with that. And that is the only request. Um, so uh, please enjoy the rest of the day, enjoy the lunch, and thank you very much for coming.